we'll go ahead and get started. So first off, my name is Daniel. Uh, I come from Missouri. I live in Michigan and I'm veteran of the United States Army. Um, and spent most of my, or beginning of my time in the infantry and got out for a bit, tried to get in law enforcement, uh, did that for a minute. And it was after 9-11 uh, when then I had gotten out the first time. And during that time, I was asked a lot of questions because uh, I just got out in August of 2001 uh, by some folks, uh, you know, asking what's going on with September 11th and who were the people who did what they did and why they did they do it. Uh, I found myself always kind of being an autodidact. That's kind of people who find something interesting and try to learn as much as possible and deep dive into things and understand it as best as they can. Uh, my, my ability to do that, um, I kind of hinted at maybe I should do something more than uh, what I was currently doing as a, a you know, brand new civ uh, civilian. And after a couple of years, my leg healed up, I had broken it and everything. Uh, I had some screws and stuff in it. And so my leg healed up and I came back in and, you know, they, uh, I said, I want to get into intelligence. And so for the next 10 years, I uh, did that. And I was everywhere from Korea to Fort Bragg, uh, obviously with 82nd and uh, several CAV units. And then I went on to uh, after a couple deployments, uh, get a chance to be uh, a national level instructor under the Military Intelligence Readiness Command. So I was stationed there just uh, outside of Chicago. And I would travel around to different army units and teach them about intelligence analysis. I was one of seven instructors under what they call the A-risk program. Uh, technically, I was active duty. So I was a, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, was under first army one of those instructors. So we travel all over the world uh, to different bases and teach the analyst uh, everything from basic to advanced skills that involved in intelligence analysis. Uh, after I suffered an injury, I had to leave the military and moved on uh, to teach for a three-layer agency, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency in St. Louis. And that, again, national instructor going around teaching about intelligence documentation and drafting and regular intelligence analysis. So one of the things that I did during that transition is my injury, and some of you might understand this, some of you may not uh, have experienced it. Uh, it changed significantly my ability to talk uh, and drive myself around and, and things of that sort. So it, it, uh, it's quite a crushing thing to do, uh, for crushing thing for me and I said, you know, I can't speak as well anymore. And I said, okay, well, let's see what else is out there. And I saw a lot of parallels. And this is my story. You know, uh, I saw a lot of parallels between cybersecurity and intelligence uh, that I had been doing. And I didn't want to live in Washington, D.C. Uh, I didn't want that life. Um, country boy from Missouri, I don't think I would really uh, fit in with uh, some folks here. I'm not saying anything anything bad about being there necessarily. It just wasn't my, wasn't my thing. And so uh, I had a buddy who got into uh, red teaming. He, me and him joined the army uh, same time. And we were best friends since we were like 12. And uh, he was having a lot of success working enterprise. And I said, you know, I'd be interested in getting cybersecurity. And I kind of already had that uh, idea a little bit when I was transitioning. And so uh, I started studying. That was the big thing. You got to prepare. If you're not, if you're one of the folks that's not out yet and you're trying to learn a little bit of where you're going to go, what do you want to do? How are you going to take the skills that you had from the military and apply them uh, in the in the private sector? Uh, you, you really got to start early. Um, now, is it going to be too late if you're already out and you don't know what you're going to do? No, it's not too late. You you got time. But this is a good role. Uh, there's a lot of uh, decision-making processes and leadership skills that you take from the military and you can apply in cybersecurity. And so uh, that's what I did. I started off uh, doing basics. So I started off working in a SOC 
uh, as a SOC analyst, uh, mostly did what they call knock work, uh, you know, networking um, when we were supposed to be doing SOC, but it was kind of a startup. So they needed to move people around to where uh, we, we, we could have be used effectively. So um, anywho, I had a good kind of chance to enter. We started when I worked as a national level instructor, I uh, started to learn about OSINT, uh, working with things like data miner and, you know, seeing how ridiculous and funny it was that, you know, Russians were posting stuff on Twitter all the time. Russian soldiers would post stuff on Twitter all the time with their military equipment and, you know, uh, uh, geotags on it and everything. And so it was, it was, it was quite hilarious when we got started with uh, learning and developing OSINT for OSINT training for the military. So I kind of got my hands into it a little bit there, but went into the SOC and the opportunity got to, uh, to get into intelligence work started off uh, at Enterprise. My buddy got me uh, in at that location. And so I started uh, there and they said, well, we don't really know how to do intelligence analysis. We know how to do investigations and stuff like that. And they said, let's teach us how to do intelligence analysis and so what i decided to you know well this is a good thing to do let's go ahead and you know lay out everything i took from the military and apply it to what this pro what they want for this program so that's what i did uh so this is where this all stems from and so uh if i could teach you one thing is that you have a lot of value from what you learn in the military uh and apply it to the private sector and there's a lot of organizations out there, like some of the sponsors here, that'll be able to help you out and are willing to hire veterans. And there's a good good reason for it. So um, with that, I'm going to start off. And let me check right quick and make sure I can't, because I can't see anybody's questions at this time. Let me see if I can see if there's anything. Okay. So is everybody... Everybody's still good. Can you still see that my screen? I see somebody said no video. Yeah, video. Okay. Awesome. All right. We're gonna we're gonna move on. Thank you for your patience. Um, this is my first time doing this at uh, VetSecCon and using this system. So my apologies for any any issues. Wouldn't be a military thing unless uh, you know PowerPoints and and videos didn't work, right? All right. So. Do you collect intellig uh, intelligence? So intelligence, if I could, there's investigations and then there's intelligence. A lot of what the misconception is, is intelligence, you th people think, well, that's just kind of collecting information and reporting it out. And, you know, it sounds a lot like telling what's on the news. That's not the case. Uh, intelligence is, what you do proactively uh, instead of reactive. Reactive is what investigations are. Investigations, you know, a crime or something occurs or an incident occurs, and then you go ahead and search what happened and you're just doing fact-based stuff of, of, of what occurred. So uh, intelligence is different. So if you had a sliding scale and I know that sliding scale was, you know, your your mission or what have you. Let's use that. There's a lot of veterans. There's veterans here, so we can use that. So you have your mission, and you have when, you know, you're on the, you're on the move, and then you have when you come back, you return. And if there was a sliding scale of that mission, even prep, you know, prep and recon and all that stuff is done, there's a sliding a slider on there is when you come into contact or when that engagement happens. And think of cybersecurity incidents in that in that way. So there's this old adage. I think it might be from some kind of Tao Te Ching or you know the the, the some old Japanese warrior uh, verbiage. And it says, you know, the the more you sweat and practice, the less you bleed in battle, right? And that's what intelligence is. Is that you're trying to figure out your threat in the situation as best as possible. Uh, so you're prepared for when that incident occurs. But that also includes knowing, 
I hate sometimes you're using this term, but you know, you have your, you know, you've heard somebody say, you know, if you have your known knowns, your known unknowns and your unknown unknowns, that's really what intelligence is. You're trying to figure out everything. And if I could, uh, in AI, I think they have this uh, ability called hill climbing. And in hill climbing, uh, it answers yes or no binary, you know, it's yes or no questions. And it says, okay, well, you know, did Bob's, you know, rob the bank? You ask a bunch of questions or who robbed the bank? And you ask a bunch of questions and, you know, was it Tim? Was it, you know, Jim? Was it whoever? And until you reach the yes answer, then it stops at that peak and you've answered the questions, but it doesn't ask any more questions. You've reached the peak. Intel, that's an investigation. You've answered all the questions and you got you got to figure it out. That's the peak. That's what they call the local maxim. Uh, in intelligence, what we try to do is if you've climbed up a mountain and you think you're at the peak, you kind of just go, okay, well, this is it. But if you look around and maybe clouds have parted and you see another peak somewhere else and you say, well, there's somewhere higher, further I can go. That's what you're trying to do in intelligence, right? So when we talk about intelligence, it's doing an intelligence program. If you run that program, or if you will in the future, I want you to ask yourselves these questions that's up here. Are you collecting intelligence or, your, or data? There's a big difference, okay? Uh, are you following the intelligence process? We'll get into that a little bit further. Uh, that's gonna be the main thing that we'll focus around. And I'm not, if you've been through intelligence work before, this is gonna be very different uh, from, from what you've learned before. Because I get into a lot of critical thinking and, and uh, uh, the art and science behind Intel. Uh, so is your organization uh, an intelligence consumer or do you just produce? Are you just receiving reports and then repeating that or are you producing it? Uh, has your leadership given uh, you, has the leadership given you their intelligence requirements, the mission or the end state? You have to have feedback and everything. We'll get into direction uh, when we go through the intelligence cycle. Does your intelligence function have a collection management framework? Like how do you find all this information that you're looking for? Do you just rely on a do you rely on a threat intelligence platform? Uh, are you using a vendor in order to get that intelligence in? So uh, that's what we're going to go over, and this is kind of my agenda, and these are the questions I kind of want you to ask once you go along. So, what is cyber threat intelligence? I'll let you read the slides, um, but first off, we got to go from transitioning from the military idea of threat intelligence to the cyber threat intelligence. Now, during my time. There wasn't really a whole lot of focus on cyber threat intelligence. It's, it wasn't as big as a, a, um, an event or, or a career as it was uh, after the fact in the last maybe five, six years. Um, I know that people have had jobs doing that, but it's, it's not been that way for, uh, it's not been that way for, for a while. So the big difference is you're taking evidence uh, based knowledge uh, about things that you already know uh, inside of threat intelligence. And here we're using it as uh, information science models. We're trying to take out data from a, a system rather than understand the nature of uh, an actual living entity like an actual army or a threat actor itself. So here we're trying to collect data from a system and to understand the nature of that system itself. So uh, what does cyber threat intelligence do to prove your organizations? So we create structured uh, structured analytical models. So you're trying to create a model to put all your data into the proper, let's say, buckets or silos. Uh, you understand cognitive processes are how people think, uh, what are the ways that you're going to think, and how are you going to conduct, uh, how are you going to understand what you're doing in that in that process? Uh, wh why are you why are you trying to try to get rid of that data that's not necessary and stuff? Investigative work we do in intelligence have to do intelligence investigation work, but that purpose of that is to uh, understand the results of what you know and then try to figure out all those gaps that you don't you don't know. So in order to do that, we have to collect and analyze other data that around it so we can put our puzzle pieces together and see what pieces are missing. We also need to understand how to communicate effectively to people and understand ways that, uh, what is a client or stakeholder, and you'll hear me use those terms throughout the day. How do, we, how do we tailor our message to whoever's listening? 
Uh, we'll get into that uh, definitely with the uh, with the dissemination part of the intelligence cycle. And you need to be able to create a product that's made in a way that all audiences that are going to listen or see your product can comprehend it and how they're going to retain that information. And we'll get into uh, with that part, we're getting into how people learn and understand and do uh, research itself. <clears throat> so why is cyber threat intelligence uh, so important here is for organizations, you want to be able to think of yourself as a intel, uh, you want to think of yourself as an advisor to your organization. And you're almost like an ambassador to the threat. You know, for your organization. So you, leadership doesn't have the time to deep dive into information and, and try to figure out you know, who the threat is necessarily. And that's why they have Intel folks. The reason why you do that is that you wanna be able to give them an idea of what their, you know, their risks are. Uh, for leadership, you know, it's gonna be driving a policy. It's uh, top, you know, top down information. You're like, this is why I need you to do this policy. And in, in the military service members, you definitely know about policies. They're all over the boards, right? Uh, they need to understand what kind of procedures they need to do in order to uh, facilitate uh, securing that risk. For managers itself, it's gonna give you the technical direction. You get your direction based off the policies and procedures and you say, this is how I'm going to manage uh, the, the objectives and, the in, and get to that end state that we're looking for. Uh, it's also operational guidance. Like how, how is your, your team gonna operate? And so we've all done uh, you know, op orders probably and warnos and sit temps and things like that. And that's kind of the same thing in the civilian sector is that you have in this intelligence uh, uh, in information security, you have to be able to provide those similar things. Uh, so for professionals itself, it goes, okay, now I have my direction, my technical direction. I've got my guidance. I know the policies. How am I going to technically apply it? I know for those of you who've uh, probably been through, uh, you know, been an NCO, uh, you've heard a term, you know, you, I'm be te technically and tactically proficient. Uh, here, we're going to be technically proficient uh, as, as, you know, an analyst, as a, 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 an architect, an engineer, you're going to have to apply that technically. Uh, and, and you are the, you know, the first, the first line that's uh, going to be dealing with this threat and you're going to collect that information and so on. So this is how cyber threat intelligence uh, does that. We provide that information so they know how to do these things. Intelligence uh, in, a, in a cyber threat information security office, so you'll see ISO, and that means I, information security office throughout my presentation. That, uh, that office, CTI, cyber threat intelligence team, should exist through all of the other teams in your information security office. The reason why is because you influence all those things. You don't you you drive operations with your intelligence. Okay, operations shouldn't drive your intelligence, and I will say that over and over again. I'm sorry for anybody who's been in operations thinks otherwise. That's not the way it goes. Intelligence drives operations. Otherwise, you'll you'll fail. So we're going to start off with the intelligence cycle. Let me check in right quick. Like I said, I'm going to figure out figure this out. Let's see if we're Still good. All right. So intelligence cycle. Uh, we're going to go through this over uh, this first session. And I'm going to keep checking my time. And we'll give a 15 minute break, I think. Or we'll, we'll give a 10 minute break the first time halfway through. Uh, we'll give a 15. Uh, and I'll let you guys decide if you need a quick lunch, a 15 or a 20 minute break. Uh, or even a 30, we'll, we'll decide. I know that people are different time zones, so we'll work with it. Okay, so this is a simplified version of the intelligence cycle. I've seen some with, you know, five different parts. I've seen some with eight and then some other stuff. I'll tell you what, I am as pragmatic as I can. I keep it simple. And you'll see why as we go through all these different things. I try to keep it simple because you got to keep that information in your head and everybody can in uh, cybersecurity will see folks who just try to create things to be that person to get that attention. 
I don't need the attention. I just want to keep it functional. I say, I say, you know, it ain't got to be pretty. It's just got to work. And that's what we're trying to do here. The intelligence cycle. Uh, first off, uh, we'll talk about direction. Direction, this is where your leadership, uh, if you ever got an op order, if you ever got a warno, uh, you know, any kind of policy or anything like that, they're going to be giving you the direction that they want to go. Uh, do they want to know about phishing emails? Do they want to know? Do they want to know about malware rebuilds? Do they need to know about insider threats? They are asked these questions and say, "This is the information." Whether it's ad hoc, formal, or what have you, they have to give you that information. Now, we do have processes in intelligence, uh, inf intelligence requirements uh, for for asking those questions and answering. Uh, you've heard, you know, uh, you know. CCIRs and you know uh, things of that sort. We're going to keep it simple. So you'll have intelligence requirements uh, uh, for information. You can have RFIs, requests for information from other teams. Uh, if I don't cover that later on today, I definitely say that you should have an RFI process uh, within your information security office. Uh, that would be for other teams to ask you pertinent questions. If you do not have that kind of communication channel between you and the other teams, you are failing. You, like I said, as a CTI, if you if you are in that program, you need to be able to communicate with all other programs, all other teams. And if they can't ask questions or they don't think, find your information as relevant, your organization is going to fail and uh, your team is probably going to be cut and they'll try to just third party it. Uh, so I, I suggest you have an RFI process in place. When you do that, uh, you know, keep track of everything of those questions. We'll, we'll cover that a little bit further. With that, they need to provide their details uh, of what kind of end state they're looking for. What is the, uh, we'll get into the ends, ways and means, but the details of what they want to see is, uh, you know, just like saying, well, I want to have uh, possess that hill, you know, go take that hill. It's, it's kind of like that. When we get into collections, uh, you take all those requirements and questions and you just figure out where you decide, where am I gonna collect this information? Uh, start divvying out to the rest of the uh, members of your, your CTI team, your intelligence team, and say, where, where are we gonna get this information? What tools do we have? Where do I find this information? Is it internal, is it external? Uh, you start to use structured models or frameworks and we'll, we'll, that way you take all that information itself and you start putting it into this proper place and you can see what's junk information and what's not. So you doing that, that's called the refinement. Now, another thing that I'll state is throughout this whole intelligence cycle, there is two other things that exist, but you don't have to put it in there. It's just called refinement and feedback. It's just knowledge that at any point, you let's say you go to direction to collection, you realize that this is probably the wrong rabbit hole or whatever to go through, that you can refine the questions, say, you know, sir, ma'am, whoever's in leadership, these questions are, uh, not answerable. Can you refine the question? You can get feedback from the other teams and say, hey, we have more information involving this, and they'll be able to ask those questions. So uh, next steps are analysis. So you take all your data itself, and you start evaluating it. You take all the knowledge that you possess, and we'll go into some other things later on today uh, and say, okay, well, do we know about the human factor? Do we understand geopolitical stuff? You know, all the knowledge base that you have as a, as a, as a veteran going into cybersecurity, there's a lot of information and, uh, and knowledge base that you have already possessed. And it's not coming from college. It's not coming from anything else but your personal wisdom and, and you know, exposure to, to, to these things. And that is a great benefit that companies are now seeing is that you know a lot about what's going on in the world because you've traveled and you've you know been part of driving geopolitics and stuff like that. So you take that knowledge base with you into uh, intelligence analysis, and and it's it's a great uh, uh, value added. And you are also going to say, okay, how do I answer the right questions? Let's say you buy something on Amazon, and do you just see something that you like and buy it, or do you look at what you want and say, okay? I really like these pair of shoes, but or these boots, 
um, or this knife or whatever and say, okay, well, is it the best? How is it rated? What did ever, what feedback have I gotten? Right. So you need to have confidence in the product that you're buying. Well, you also have to take uh, in this sense, determine what kind of confidence you have in the data you've collected. Okay. Then you start creating the intelligence based on that. And that's driven by the first two parts. Once you've analyzed everything and you say, this is the answer that I'm looking for, this is what I, our, our best determination, then you have to communicate that to whoever is your, your client or stakeholder. So you're gonna form that intelligence into a format that, that somebody can actually put process. Uh, you have to draft that product, you have to create it, write it and sound it out and get peer reviews and listen to what you're doing. Um, you take that intelligence and not just report to news, you know, you have to put your, your, your thought process and everything from your experience into it, because if you just report the news, you're also going to fail. It's just, it, a lot of organizations who do that, who just report news fail because they don't take enough consideration of what's going on internally in their organization. So <clears throat> you also need to get that uh, feedback from whoever the stakeholder client is and say, okay, well, are, well, are the actions that are taken based off my intelligence effective? And one of the things that uh, you probably heard before, if you heard about intelligence, it needs to be timely. It needs to be, you know, something that it happens in a time that that you can actually action on it. So it needs to be actionable. And it needs to be relevant to your organization. If you're just reporting the news or you're just listening to a third party about what is going on in the threat landscape it's not going to be an effective intelligence program because it doesn't consider the internal stuff and larger vendors, third parties, you know, uh, tips, threat intelligence platforms may not have everything tailored to your needs. They have several customers and, uh, you know, they try and they have, you know, uh, customer success managers and stuff like that, that try to find out what's best for you, but it's not as good as you looking inside and doing it. So, Let's start off with the, the first part of direction. This is uh, what I call uh, intelligence preparation of the cyber environment. Uh, I think there's only one other speaker I've really kind of uh, heard this from, uh, and he think he's over in the UK. <clears throat> it's similar to intelligence preparation of the, of the battlefield. You know, you understand that, you know, the terrain, what's the, the, the people that you're going to be encountering, uh, whether they're you know, supported, unsupported, un, you know, favorable, the enemy, you know, uh, dangerous risk, what have you. Here, you got to understand yourself. So this is a, a, a system and definitely continuous process where you're trying to, uh, you got to update everything and understand, you know, what, it, what, what am I to the threat, right? What are, what's my network, my assets and my data that I possess that's uh, ideal or why am I a target? We'll definitely get further into that later on, but you gotta understand why the threat actor is doing what they are doing and why at this time. Uh, we'll get in, we can talk about patterns of life. We can talk about motivation and, and everything. Uh, it's, it's really you understanding yourself. So um, I'm a big guy, I'm about 6'3". And if I walked into uh, you know, a dangerous neighborhood, my risk is probably a little bit less. So if I go into a bar that's a little rowdy, my risk is a little bit less than maybe, you know, a 110 pound wet person going in there, uh, you know, dressed as a clown, you know, there's, you're getting, what, atten what attention are you trying to gather, right? So you got to understand why, what you look like to the threat actor itself. You also got to understand your environment that you're in. Okay. Are you financial? Are you an organization that's at financial risk? Are you in the news right now because of some kind of thing that's that's been going on with a VIP? Understand how to fight against this this threat, right? So know what your strengths are. Is it are your strengths to sock? Are you able to shut things down right at the beginning? Is your strengths with investigations and incident response? Uh, is it in your intelligence program? Are you, are you doing so much work proactively that you're, you're doing great and you, you're just, you know, blocking everything. So you got to also understand where you can, you need to improve. So current or current and, uh, uh, you know, ongoing assessments are, are what's supposed to occur. 
that's definitely part of this in this process itself. So basically, like I say, know yourself in relation to your threats. What's one way you can do it? Uh, here, I want you, uh, if you do a, a program, you do something similar to this. This is what I call key threat objectives. Okay, you could think of it as crown jewels. You can think of why, why do these things are important itself? Uh, uh, what do you look like? This is why we're kind of doing this assessment and like look in the mirror and see what's important uh, for your organization. Uh, so is it the money that you have? I know with uh, the ransomware attacks that were in the last couple of years, they looked at who are the leaders within their, within their own industries and how are they doing financially? That was a lot of the recon that was going occurring. And so they were looking at their finances. Uh, is it your assets itself? Is it something, let's say you're China and they're looking into your organization because you're in, uh, doing a lot of R&D and they want to collect that information itself and say, okay, well, how can we reverse engineer this thing? I just saw a video the other day of uh, a drone dropping off one of those robot dogs with a automatic, with a saw or squad automatic weapon on the back and, and everything. And it looks exactly like that robot dog for that you see in like, I think MIT or Boston, what, what have you, uh, those little robot dogs, exactly the same. And that's what China does is they look at what your assets are, your, uh, what, what you have, and you consider this, you can consider this an intellectual property, but it's like, what is, what is important to your threat actor? Is it Russia and they're financially motivated and they're trying to get money and credit card information and use, uh, what they call, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for again? Sorry. Well, they, they try to, mules, they try to use mules and they buy a bunch, have mules uh, take your credit card information, buy a bunch of products on Amazon or Yahweh or something, receive that, uh, that product and then sell it and then make money and launder it through there. Is it your VIPs? Uh, Twitter's getting, uh, going through some changes as of late. Uh, I, th I think that uh, there's a lot of uh, eyes on their, their, you know, the leadership there and what's going to occur. Maybe somebody from the outside of threat actor sees them as, as, as their target. Is it brand loyalty? Is it, is it something that a product that's important to everybody? And, you know, let's say they have a lot of your information as a consumer and are they maintaining that information and keeping a hold of it? Uh, are they trying to, I'm sorry, are they taking that information and now you think, well, I can't allow this organization to maintain my information uh, and, and keep it secure. So now I have to go to some other, uh, some other place. The, the losing faith in the consumer, losing faith in your organization. These are the things that they try to affect. Now, this is not, you know, rock solid. This is not something that needs to be like this. It can be what's important to you. Uh, maybe you're within the energy industry and things change. Maybe you're within biomedical and, and, and your uh, key threat objectives are slightly different. Uh, it's up to you to make, make your own assessment of who you are. <clears throat> so uh, intelligence directives are, are what kind of drive uh, after that fact. Like, well, let's, let's look at ourselves and say, okay, what are the questions we need to ask in relationship to the threat? You know, um, what are you, what are those uh, goals that you're looking for in, in doing your intelligence? Are we trying to secure a system? Are we trying to identify, uh, where our emails are being manipulated or being email compromise is occurring? Uh, what are the assets that we need to protect? Is it your servers? Is it your active directory? Is it your pay systems? Uh, you know, what act, what threat actors are affecting you itself? So intelligence directives are here to establish a clear set of intelligence goals for multiple stakeholders. Those raw information must be collected through established intelligence directives that adhere to those organizational and operational procedures. So intelligence directives are a result of that guidance from your information security decision makers. And they try to seek that answer uh, in a contextual, timely and critical intelligence questions. And those, try to focus on those key threat objectives. Uh, so a CTI team must be able to answer those questions with actionable responses and enabling that CTI focused analyst to divide their resources and answer them in a timely manner. Intelligence directives are actually written as questions and given to the cyber threat intelligence team so they can make those uh, uh, decisions, so those decision makers can uh, know what's going on. 
And it kind of looks like this. So when you have your intelligence team, uh, they must answer those, those questions. Those directors are, are motivated definitely through that intelligence preparation in the cyber environment, uh, through understanding uh, really things like I think Verizon has what they call a DFIR or DVIR correction. Uh, so they can understand the cyber threat landscape. Uh, you're writing out your key threat objectives like we just covered. And if you have a drink, go ahead and drink it because I'm going to say MITRE ATT&CK heat map, uh, MITRE ATT&CK framework. If you've uh, ever seen that before, you haven't become familiar with it because it's kind of an industry standard, uh, but you can develop an industry, uh, a MITRE ATT&CK uh, heat map where you understand the life cycle of the threat or the incident itself and you lay it out in that framework to understand it. So those things drive your, your intelligence directives. And so you can ask questions like, okay, well, what types of PII are we seeing in the email abuse reports? Uh, what teams are targeted the most? You know, uh, you'll find things like uh, an email compromise. You'll find the human resources and anybody has to do with billing. It has a lot of phishing emails uh, being attacked. So you ask those questions, you answer them, and that kind of gives you, guides you into where you're uh, trying to get to. Well, when you, let's check time check right quick. At 10 minutes till, I'll put you guys on a 10 minute break and we'll come back. So one of the ways we can do this, and I know that some uh, Intel teams don't do this, uh, I think you should, uh, it's called a collection management framework. Now, a collection management framework is basically going, okay, where do I get this information from? Like, if I have all this data, where do I get it from? If I have a question about some system, where do I, what, what system do I use to ask that question? Okay, how long is that data, uh, how do we, long do we maintain that data? Okay, what kind of data am I going to be finding when I go into that system? Uh, what kind of questions are, is that data going to answer? Is it going to answer holistically? Is it going to answer just a portion? I have to go to another tool in order to find it. And that's the problem is there's so many tools and, and vendors and, and, and capabilities out there that you may not understand necessarily where to go with it. So this is kind of a basic, like I said, I try to be as basic as possible when it comes to this or as pragmatic as I can. Uh, you just do an Excel sheet and you ask yourselves that question. As you can see here, where is my collecting it? What tools have is that you know? What tools has that data? How far back I can get that information? That's a big thing too. Some of your tools may be only able to collect for 90 days, and then you have to put it in cold storage, uh, as they call it. So, and then you have to have a time that you, you know, how long is that cold storage going to hold onto that information, and be able to pull, come back up with it? Okay, that's important because you may have to investigate something. You might have to look at historical trends and you might not be able to have that information available to you anymore. And knowing that is going to be a big factor when you're doing cyber threat intelligence. Uh, those trends, you know, you got to think that uh, maybe more scams happen during the holidays. You know, what had happened last year? Well, if you can't pull back that information because your tools don't go back that far, uh, and you can't develop those trends, it's going to be a problem. So it's good to understand that. Uh, what kind of output are you going to get from it? Are you going to get the data that happened? You know, who is uh, sending the email and who, who did they send it to? Are you going to be able to go into that header data of your email itself and see, you know, is it something being obfuscated? What was, what was, what was in that, the lines there that they were trying to, trying to receive? So like I said, this is kind of an undeveloped one, but you can create it. And that's the great thing about this, uh, uh, this whole program that I'm, or the session that I'm doing here, these are all things I'm going to teach you how to do it for yourself. You don't have to rely on somebody for it. This is teaching how to do it yourself and being a, a that, that value added, uh, that force multiplier for your organization, for your team. So one of the ways that uh, collection management framework works is uh, we're going to go into uh, more of your internal intelligence collection. Uh, here, what we're going to discuss is maybe you were going to do a monthly reporting and I discussed phishing emails or malware rebuilds. Uh, you get those reports and you kind of understand your threats a little bit because this is what we're doing is we're not going to collect just external information. We're not news reporters and you're going to get fired if, if, uh, uh, if, if that's all you do or your team's going to be, you know, uh, uh, canceled because what use are you if you don't understand your organization and what's occurring in it? That's why you're an in intel. So maybe it's 
uh, you trying to get email abuse uh, metrics and you can decide, okay, well, I'm going to follow along here when it says uh, notes, you kind of understand the life cycle through the attack framework, MITRE attack framework. And you say, okay, what's occurring in this whole threat life cycle? Uh, what's the what's the role of of uh, the incident? Like who who was involved in that incident? Who was attacked? Who you know was it the VIP? Uh, maybe you have to go and look into uh, attack and fill in the attack heat map and say, okay, this is this is what the analysis is uh, saying, and you can do that by running sandboxes. Uh, it, you know, running your system through or running the threat. The, uh, uh, the malware or what have you through a sandbox and go, okay, this is, this is what it looks like. It breaks it all down and you can, uh, we can talk later on, I guess, if you want to uh, talk about some sandboxes and stuff like that, but it's a great tool to have. Uh, another thing is maybe you have a reverse engineer in your team. I would suggest that uh, so they can actually take it, play with it and, and then walk it back and say, okay, this is, this is what it tried to do. That's important in the Intel. Uh, you get your indicators too, you know, maybe it's your I, the IPs uh, that you're looking for. Uh, maybe it's something within the code and, and it's directing uh, what, it's, what it's trying to look for. What's the malware once you make that determination? This is the kind of thing that you have to produce because it's so important. How are you supposed to understand threats if you don't know what your relationship is to it? And that's why we're doing internal uh, intelligence collection. And you can give a short description of, of of what was occurring. You don't want to get too far in the analysis because too much information could be uh, a, a problem. So uh, this is definitely an essential part and you try to use that data as best as possible. And you definitely got to uh, narrow it down in, into you know what, what information is relevant. This is where we get into the relevancy uh, part of it. And so that information can be exploited for producing your own cyber threat intelligence. And that identifies, you know, whether it's relevant, timely information, and uh, that can be used to mitigate block or create alerts. And it's imperative to an organization's information security capabilities. Time check here. We'll do four or five more minutes and then we'll, we'll take a break. So how do we do this? And I suggest when you do these, uh, do these things. There's one process that I've done uh, when I used to run the Intel shop. Uh, when I was, uh, it, I was part of the Intel shop with the 82nd. I ran it for a bit uh, for my for my squadron, and we had we had to do a lot of uh, work with operations and understanding what you know what was occurring. Uh, so we have to do what we call storyboards. So let's say you have an engagement or something like that, or an incident in this case for cyber, and you gotta go, okay, well, what happened itself? So you lay out the situation itself and you, and you could do that through what I call storyboards. And if you've ever written a storyboard before, it's basically just a matter of fact, what occurred. <clears throat> I do this uh, for myself where I, I lay out, you know, take screenshots of what happened. I create a behavioral tree. Uh, and there's some tools out there that'll do a behavioral tree for you, uh, whether it's a SOAR platform or, or what have you, and it'll tell you exactly what happened. Uh, whether it's in the sandbox, sandboxes will do it too, according to you know MITRE or whatever uh, framework they decide to use. But you got to break it down into what what occurred, and then you can look at the gaps and what was collected, and then maybe the incident didn't the malware didn't go through its full cycle. You know, maybe something, something blocked it and kept it from doing what it wanted to do. So you need to lay that out in some kind of storyboard, however you decide to do it. Um, you can also uh, do uh, malware rebuild uh, reports and see, you know, what, what the malware wanted to do too. Uh, I suggest you do that before you do your incident response. I mean, your hunting uh, from your incident response team where they will, when they hunt, they go in and they, they find out exactly uh, you know exactly what occurred and they write out a full report. I love working with those guys. If you don't have a fusion group and, and once you get into maturity models uh, later on here with me, uh, you'll see that it's good to have a, hunt, a hunting team and be able to also create a fusion group with like a SOC member that's intelligence uh, focused and a hunter and yourself and maybe even a red teamer. Uh, and, and I can talk you through that, that process a little bit more. But <clears throat> here, we, we try to 
you know, create a storyboard and understand the situation itself. And so uh, what that does is it, it definitely breaks everything down and you can understand the campaign. Uh, you know, campaigns, sometimes threat actors do it to multiple organizations at once. They figured out some kind of malware, some kind of process, some kind of scheme in order to uh, allow this to occur. You got to understand the behavior while they're under. Are they moving low and slow? Are they, you know, quick? Or are they just doing just, uh, a denial of service? And what does it mean in the MITRE ATT&CK framework? You got to look at your, you know, your, your puzzle itself and say, okay, what pieces do I have? So. <clears throat> check one more time here and i think uh we'll hit this last part here we'll finish up uh before break here on internal so how do you do that so with if you've ever been a hunter before uh you've got a couple different hunt uh methodologies that you can utilize you can do it through ttp you know techniques techniques and procedure uh driven hunts <clears throat> so you can understand the known behaviors and those tactics excel you can do ioc driven hunts so you look for those indicators of compromise and and uh start investigating those things and say okay you know what has this been seen before uh we can talk about information sharing groups where they'll put that information out there uh big organizations maybe like target and amazon and you know some of the other uh, big ones they'll share a lot of information and reporting from those and they'll share those indicators of compromise those iocs and and you can look for those uh e you know, even if somebody's reporting it out and external information, you gather that information. You go, hey, let me. This is really sketchy. Let's say like the Citrix vuln that occurred a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, people start putting these information, these indicators out, and you say, well, let me look for it in my systems. Maybe it got you know it circumvented all of our our our, our tools, and maybe I can find it in my in my network itself. Uh, analytics driven uh, hunts. Uh, you know, these are. Uh, these themselves, uh, I'm I'm not personally too familiar with how to do it. Uh, I won't I won't try to act like a professional and analytic driven, uh, but I, I think it's more behavior, uh, behavior analytics itself. Like what what was the strange thing that was occurring uh, within its within the network itself. So these are where you identify actual items and you can be discovered uh, by the hunt team and. So what we try to do is understand the full scope of the suspected attack and those that intelligence information is driven from that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put you on a break and everybody kind of return in 10, 10 minutes, you can say, uh, you know, on the, on the clock or on, on the turn of the hour or a couple of minutes after and, and then I'll start back up. Okay, uh, where we left off, now we're going to get into uh, external intelligence collection. Uh, we talked a little bit about this, and let me make sure everybody can hear me. Can everybody hear me okay? Give me one person, give me a thumbs up. All right. All right, so external intelligence collection. Uh, this is like I said before, uh, external collection is uh, driven by reports that you get from peer organizations and information security community. Uh, we help each other out. Uh, I talked about information sharing uh, groups, uh, ISACs, you'll hear that uh, again. And this involves, uh, uh, this is done to involve a lot of the, the cyber threat landscape here and us understanding it. Uh, this form of collection is not used uh, by CTI to give unprocessed intelligence to your information security teams, but it does provide to CTI the context uh, for the internal intelligence information uh, that has or will be collected. And this can come in the forms of uh, your uh, research reports, understanding APTs, advanced, uh, advanced persistent threat groups, uh, understanding those malicious threats and vulnerabilities that you have. So knowing yourself and knowing the threat, uh, those IOCs, indicators and compromise itself, any kind of trends you developed in incidents or understanding what kind of breaches 
that have occurred. It definitely is a CTI. You want to understand the breaches that have occurred. Those are big events, and they could have an impact on you if it's related to any kind of third party or vendor uh, that you might be using. And there's a lot. It's like a big spider web. Everybody's kind of got you know six degrees of separation uh, uh, within the cyber community, cybersecurity community. Is it cyber crime itself? Uh, looking at uh, some of those things, I know I discussed a little bit. I think uh, with sometimes cybercrime or an incident can involve uh, things like uh, I think Russian uh, fin organizations, financial organizations, uh, threat groups. I should say uh, they they may attack ATMs themselves or point of sale systems rather than something that's necessarily within your network. It may be something uh, external that they try to affect. It could be social engineering. Uh, to get into your organization, the building itself, and try to get a result through social engineering. <clears throat> and it's also development of hacking tools. Do you go into the deep and dark web, go into the marketplaces and see people talking about things they're developing or talk to some of what they call the fight clubs, or the security researchers who, who look at things and say, okay, what's, what's occurring here? I'm gonna move a just a little bit faster so we keep a good pace and nobody gets too bored. So how do we do this itself? Uh, there's a lot of tools out there. These are just some examples. Uh, you know, it, it could be anything from a low cost to a no cost. Uh, it could be very expensive. Uh, I won't say any, any kind of vendors, but I ran some big organizations who had an incident, bought a big vendor, a tip, a, a threat intelligence platform, uh, some kind of tool to fix their problem. And it just, it, it, it killed their security program because they spent way too much too, too quickly. Uh, so you want to make sure that you do that and uh, do some research into what you're what you're purchasing. There's a lot of uh, free and, like I said, low cost ones out there. Uh, I think these are some of the the, the free or, or very cheap ones that I I, I like to utilize. Um, but if, for those who've been in cybersecurity for a bit, you understand some of these. Uh, also, those like I said, those information sharing groups for me to be retail uh, or retail financial. Auto, uh, uh, the FBI has a great program called InfraGuard. Uh, props to them for communicating with the private organizations uh, uh, out there and sharing some of that information. Uh, there, there, you know, a lot of good, good folks there that are uh, part of InfraGuard, and that's a good place to be in. Uh, sometimes that information's a little bit earlier than what maybe what you can run into in the private sector. Uh, sometimes it's good information, but also it's sometimes really generalized. So those are those are some external ones. I like to do OSINT, uh, uh, open source inf uh, intelligence information. Uh, you can't be doing your own, following the intelligence cycle and doing your own collection itself uh, for through OSINT. There's some, we can have a discussion if you guys want to do a Q&A a little bit more and ask more about OSINT and some processes and some tools and some, sources uh even after this uh workshop session uh i can i can try to follow up and, and give you some tools and, and tips so we'll move on from collection so you've collected your information uh you have all the puzzle pieces laid out on the floor or on the table and you're just looking at it and going, oh gosh what do i do with this you know you got to have a guide you got to have a process so what CTI does is they use both the internal and external intelligence information uh, from the collection process. And in order to identify possible, excuse me, uh, TTPs and IOCs that are out there, uh, you use that uh, analysis process uh, that CTI assesses those IOCs and TTPs through, uh, through these methodologies here. Uh, the TTPs you can think of, uh, I know that if somebody I know in staff, I think staff college, uh, they discussed operational design. Uh, I think it's called, uh, one of the guys that led that was the Eichmeier, uh, I think is his name, the Eichmeier method of operational design. And he discusses ends, ways, and means. Uh, that's basically any kind of incident itself, uh, any kind of planning. I mean, if you drive your car, you have, you know, what's the route that I'm gonna take? You're doing intelligence when you go drive your car and you decide to do stuff because you know the route you figure out the route that you're going to take you know where you're going to go to how you, what's the platform that you're going to use your car 
to get where you want to go? Do you have enough gas? What's the weather like? You're already doing this whole process in everyday activities. And you do that through understanding uh, uh, the ends, ways, and means in which you're going to do this event. And that's the way it is here. So with a with an incident, you got to understand uh, the TTPs. And when you go into the MITRE TECH framework, that's the way it's structured is TTPs, mostly te techniques and tactics um, that, that, that these things occur and how you're going to understand it. It's through these frameworks that uh, we'll discuss later that you'll be able to uh, get a holistic uh, understanding of what all these pieces mean that you've got through the collection part portion. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, these IOCs are uh, put through some frameworks uh, or discussed the MITRE TECH framework. Later on, I'll cover the diamond model a little bit, but it's also your analysis of, of that malware. Like I said, if you have a CTI program, start getting into understanding how to utilize a sandbox or have a reverse engineer that can do so that's professionally trained in doing that. Uh, one of these one of these processes that we try to utilize uh, is uh, what's up here next is this here example, I believe, was from the Citrix Vuln that occurred a couple of years ago. Uh, so what you try to do is you try to identify some of the campaigns. And in this case, I think there was three campaigns that were part of this whole vulnerability uh, for the Citrix servers. Uh, one was, I believe, a, and don't. It's I'm not 100% solid. This is the information that we had uh, that I collected during that time. Uh, I think first it was a crypto miner uh, that you know they're just going to using up all that that uh, uh, capability itself uh, to to mine crypto and stuff. And you, you know unless you weren't keeping an eye on it properly, it was it was they had a back door to do so. Uh, the next portion was uh, I, it's called not Robin. Uh, uh, this uh, this one, I believe what they did was the threat actor would go into a system that had that vulnerability and patch it, but create themselves a backdoor. So anybody that looked at it that wasn't professional about doing patch management and you know patching your systems, they would look at it and go, oh, okay, it's patched. I guess we're good. You know, and, and if you don't communicate with your other teams, your engineers, your architects and all that stuff, you would fall into this trap where you go, okay, well, this vulnerability itself is, is patched. Okay, we're good. Uh, I don't know who did it, but okay, let's move on. Complacency has just killed you. Uh, and this is what that part of that campaign tried to do is, is play on your, your complacency and in security and even in the military, that, that's a killer. Uh, so this is what the Not and Robin thing uh, did. Uh, Ragnarok was ransomware. Um, uh, I didn't get too further into that, but you understand those campaigns. Uh, same thing with uh, Magecart. Magecart was, uh, I think, a Russian financial uh, thing. And it wasn't just one uh, campaign. Uh, they broke up their campaigns in groups into different skimmers. Uh, I think at one point when I first investigated, it had probably about seven different skimmers. So you had to understand seven different methodologies and groups. But I think it went even further and double or tripled in the amount of skimmers that they utilize because what do what do threat actors and, and malware do? You know, are always refining. They're always trying to make things better. They always pivot from from that uh, thing that they 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 got uh, in the way. So in order to understand these, we try to understand those TTPs. And in here uh, you look at those TTPs of like, okay, well what was the delivery system? What was the what was the trigger? Okay. Uh, so you understand the campaign, you understand those IOCs and those those TTPs that you were trying to um, try to gather, and you put them in uh, the proper place, and you look at uh, the IOCs that are involved in that. So <clears throat> uh, when when that occurs, CTI definitely has a larger role in the, uh, in those investigations where uh, malicious behavior is structured into specific and articulable facts. Uh, that's what we're trying to do here when we do this. Uh, CTI must do this so that those stakeholders can understand the behavior and later on turn these facts into actionable items. Check if there was any questions right off the top of my head. Oh, okay. <clears throat> okay, so 
next portion is we're going to evaluate that intelligence. So CTI definitely uh, uses different kinds of, uh, we do use a lot of spreadsheets and, uh, you know, whether it's Google, whether it's Microsoft, uh, you know, whatever system you want to, or whatever uh, uh, product producing uh, uh, systems that you want to utilize, whatever framework you decide to utilize, you don't have to be stuck on one. I know that some, some, you know, or per guidance that you're given, you know, what do you, what are you supposed to use as a framework? Uh, you know, you, you have that option, but you can also create your own. What's going to work for you? And we'll definitely see that here later on. Uh, you have to figure out what's best for you to develop the intelligence and evaluate it the proper way. So the way that we do this first is uh, we look at the data itself. Let's understand the nature of, of what we're talking about here. So data itself uh, is, is very granular, specific, and that data uh, answers yes or no questions. Is it articulable facts, right? Is it there or is it not? Uh, is it good? Is it bad? Right? That's data. It's not, it's not something that is an opinion. It is not anything else in what it is. Okay. Information itself uh, is that data put together to, to, to make a statement itself. And it requires a lot of information, a lot of information uh, that you get in the collection process that you need to refine in order to get it done, break it down. So it's very investigative in nature, but it's that data put together in a structured format and you're just throwing out the stuff that's not relevant, right? Intelligence itself, it definitely determines, uh, uh, you know, the investigative part of what it is, but it also tells you that, like I talked about the local maximum, that, 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 peak, you didn't, that peak of the mountain you didn't see behind the clouds. It's what can be, or as <clears throat> I think uh, it was stated, before, I stated before, you have your known knowns, your known unknowns, and your unknown unknowns. I know some people hate that term, but it 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 explains a lot of things uh, in proper context. So uh, it, intelligence itself, you, you know, it not necessarily can. It's it's not yes or no questions. Okay, is the sky blue? Yes. You know, is water wet? Yes. It's not. It's not like that. It's it's. What is the nature of the sky right now? When you go into it and go, well, the sky is blue with a little bit of clouds, and later on it'll be storming and things like that. So you have to give context or provide the so what in your intelligence. If you fail to do that, your intelligence is not structured properly, it is not refined, and it is not uh, able to be disseminated because it is not intelligence, it's just information. It's just news reporting, and it's it's you failed in your process to that point. That's why when I say through the intelligence cycle, you should have uh, um, refinement and feedback because if you get to this point and you're evaluating your intelligence and all you're doing is just answering yes or no questions, you're failing. You are providing context. You're providing that so what. <clears throat> and how can how can we do this? We're evaluating intelligence. Okay, so. This is a kind of a representation itself. So you're taking your information, a tool or whatever system you're pulling from and collecting that data. And as you see here, there's tons of information, very granular and, and very matter of fact. Uh, and you process that itself and then you turn that into information and you're doing that through processing it through frameworks and exploiting that information and saying, you know what, uh, if, if you're worried about if you're worried about cyber threats and somebody says something about there was a gun robbery in McDonald's, you're like, well, that's not relevant at all. Let's let's get rid of that. Okay. You got to analyze that information and be like, what is this information trying to tell me? Right. And then you develop your final product. So let's say you're doing this and, and you're, you've got an intelligence directive that says, okay, well, what types of PII, uh, personally identifiable information uh, is, is sought through that email abuse uh, report that we saw? Okay, well, we figured out that employee credentials uh, uh, make up 85% of the phishing emails targeted information. That's what they're seeking out. And, and as you can see there, you know, your collecting, uh, your collection portion is going to say, yeah, we're pulling it from our local systems and it's definitely coming from our email, uh, our email collection. And that's a large portion of what we're seeing. Uh, so this is uh, where you're going, okay, well, what's the biggest risk? for us right now. 
the law. It's it's you know spear fishing. Okay. <clears throat> so and that's how you you, you kind of get into that in intelligence information. Now the question was asked, how do you develop it or what is an actionable intelligence? Okay. Uh, I left a lot of lot to read here because I do not want to mess this up. Okay. <clears throat> so not only does I say you're supposed to be relevant, timely, and actionable, it has to be focused. You have to be uh, somewhat concise in what you're saying. You have to be precise, but you also have to be concise. You have to be able to say what you're saying in an effective way so it's retainable information. If you just throw a freaking 300 page report at somebody, you're gonna miss out on so much. You really are. And I'll get into that whole critical thinking and how people retain information part here in, here in uh, later, later blocks. But uh, why, you know, why is that so important? Uh, actionable intelligence, you're trying to understand the nature of, of the attack itself and what they wanted to do the in state. Uh, you know, this is where I cover, you know, you're trying to, what are the intel knowns? You know, you got the blocking alerting is what indicated what was going on. Uh, the unknown things are where you're trying to run that, you got to sample that malware, you're trying to run it through and see what's going on. Uh, you're trying to look at the, you know, the URLs and see where you've seen it before. Uh, what are the unknown things? Maybe you've got systems out there that you're not familiar with. Maybe you just had an M&A process uh, and you've acquired a new company and maybe there's a system that just uh, came on onto yours and you didn't look at it. You didn't do a, a scan of it. You didn't research it before you hooked it up to your network. I know a big organization that suffered some of something uh, like that. You got to understand what systems you have themselves. But if you don't go looking for it, you don't do your intelligence preparation of the cyber environment, you won't be able to understand those uh, what what you have out there in your network and the infrastructures that you have. Uh, and and then uh, unknowing the knowns, um, you got to be able to be one of those folks that produces that intelligence. Like I said, if you're just a consumer, your your team's going to fail. Uh, you 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 got to provide that. So what? And I, I'm going to hit on that over and over again. If you're not you're not providing that relevant information, you're 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 not going to be an effective and successful uh, information security team. One of the ways that we can understand the nature of things, uh, there's a diamond model. I forgot who created it, but you'll hear probably heard it before. And if not, you'll hear about it again uh, here in the future. Uh, you need to be able to provide. Uh, that kind of intelligence that answers these questions uh, is not only the different parts of any kind of situation. Uh, I'll cover this a little bit further in when I talk about situational awareness, but this is the nature, the, a, a simple framework to understand any incident itself. You have to have, uh, it's a natural process of understanding who is the adversary, who's the threat actor. Uh, who's who's the victim here? Is it you? Is it one of your uh, one of your team, uh, your uh, peer organizations? Maybe you're doing an assessment for for an organization, uh, and you're uh, a managed service provider, and you're trying to understand the threat for your client. What infrastructure were they trying to attack? That's owned by you. What is the capability of the malware, the tool, the weaponization or weaponized uh, thing that was used utilized against you? And what's the relationship between all those things? That's why the diamond, if you don't understand these things, the simple framework here, I would apply this to every incident itself. Write this out. And that way you can build off of it. That's where you can build your details into it. And it's where you can take that, refine that intelligence that you collected already and put it in there and say, yeah, this fits that model itself. Okay. So here, uh, we're going to make sure that whenever we answer those questions, we're going to answer, you know, the typical who, you know, who, what, when, where, why, and how. Uh, it's got to have context itself. And, and by doing that, you have to create answers to those questions that were asked through those intelligence directives that you were given or questions that you've developed while you're going through the collection process. Okay. Uh, intelligence also creates questions. You get to talk about refinement and feedback. You got to ask questions uh, based on every bit of information that you get. They're like, why would they? Why would they want to attack point of sale systems? You know, by asking that question, maybe you understand what threat actor or a little bit of attribution that you can, you can, you can gain from that. Okay. Oh, they're very financially motivated. Oh, they were trying to attack a college into their 
uh, R and D part of their of of the college. That's a big that's a big thing. Uh, why were they attacking a you know why was he victim a school an elementary school you know why why are those you have to ask those questions so you can provide those answers okay and you can also <laughs> it sounds silly but intelligence questions answers you have to ask if this is relevant if this matters you know this is why we get i suggest significant training in critical thinking it's it's not taught enough uh you, the way that you probably determine this these lessons that I'm giving you from maybe some other certifications is that I'm teaching you how to do intelligence. I'm not teaching you how to follow a guide and do exactly and replicate what they're doing. I'm teaching you how to think for yourself and be a professional and be malleable and able to go from one organization to another with these skill sets. Because this is what the cybersecurity community is missing in cyber threat intelligence. You are not, there's an art and a science between behind intelligence analysis. And when I say art and science, the art of being able to uh, articulate the things that you need to put out, being able to understand people's thought processes, okay? Being able to write effectively so it's retainable, uh, being able to create products like creating slides so somebody can look at it, knowing how much text that you need to put on a slide. I know that if you've been your service member, that's a pain in the butt. Nobody wants to sit here and read a whole bunch of text all the time, okay? Or nobody wants a whole bunch of, uh, you know, you need to understand what colors, I guess, when you do a presentation, some text can be read. There's a science behind understanding uh, the way, you know, a network or computer works. You got to be able to get into cyber threat intelligence with some kind of technical knowledge. So these things are important, and I'm teaching you the way to do this and be malleable and be able to move from, uh, and malleable and dynamic and be able to do this through multiple organizations and not just here's how this tool works i don't i don't want to do that to anybody uh so that's why we're going to be a little bit different we're going to understand not just what uh what happened on your network or what happened in your computer you're going to understand human component too you're going to be able to understand geopolitics you'll be able to understand frameworks and how to develop them and stuff so we'll we'll, we'll definitely get into that but intelligence you need to yeah, for intelligence, you need to be able to develop, uh, develop it yourself, and that's the value added that as you move along. Next portion is uh, we're gonna do disseminate, uh, disseminate products. Uh, first off, we're gonna start with strategic level, uh, and I'll get more into to the difference between strategic, operational, and tactical. Uh, but here, let's talk about think of it almost like uh, TTP. TTP is basically restating strategic uh, through tactical uh, because you're, you know, tactics, techniques, and procedures. Procedures is policy. Policy is at the leadership level. Who develops strategic strategy? The ones who develop uh, uh, the leadership that develops policy. Okay. So you need to be able to uh, create, you know, that high level understanding for them. Okay. Uh, this uh, is what drives uh, their understanding in high level is what's going to drive their policy, not necessarily how to do it. Uh, that would that would be poor leadership on how to actually do it uh, in, my, in, in, in my way. That's why you trust uh, the professionals that you have in the managerial area, the, the operational level. But you understand what kind of uh, uh, threats that, you know, what's the threat actor group that you're that's affecting you? Uh, what's their motivations and, and the ability that they have to, to do this? And what's the impact that's going to occur? Because they need to be able to make decisions as decision makers, right? So how do we do this? Uh, one of the ways that I like to do it is what I discussed earlier that there are storyboards, the investigative part, right? You can also develop a product for the operational level, and that's uh, going to be more of your assessment part. Uh, and that way you're going to... Uh, understand you know okay well hey this is a system that occurred this occurred on uh what i like to do is take the storyboard do the investigation do the hunt do the reverse malware uh uh, uh the reverse engineering uh do my intelligence from external and in, external and internal portions and then I put them into a cyber threat analytical report and i'm in that in that i'm going to provide a strategic level high level understanding of what occurred because i'm looking at the whole picture i put the puzzle piece together 
by following the intelligence cycle. And now I'm providing that strategic implication uh, within, within the CTAR, the Cyber Threat Analytical Report. And it covers the campaigns, it covers the trends, it covers the key threat objectives that we were looking for, excuse me. Uh, and then you got categorical reporting where we talked about uh, looking at yeah, phishing email reporting or malware rebuilds. Uh, that's that's uh, you going, okay, well, here's the results. If you've ever been to a staff meeting before when the military, you kind of give the updates of, you know, everybody goes around to the different leaders and different company commanders or what have you and say, okay, well, here's what's going on. And then they make that decision to drive policy. That's what we're doing at the strategic, strategic level. And in doing so, we're answering that question, like I said before, okay, well, what information security teams are targeted financially, uh, motivated uh, phishing emails, uh, human resources. Great, we answered the question. And that's gonna, what that does is that creates questions for you to go back after the dissemination part, the uh, dissemination portion, it's gonna create new questions. Maybe you've created heat map and you, uh, a MITRE tech heat map, and you've been through the process of going, okay, we've identified what it means on the MITRE tech framework. We've had talked to the red team and they tested against those things that we identified as weaknesses. They've purple teamed it. They've, you know, they've uh, uh, worked with the SOC and we've made the fixes. And now that is no longer a problem. Oh, okay. Well, let's look at the next thing at the risk uh, as a risk and say, okay, well, what's what's occurred uh, uh, lately? Well, what are the things that we have not worked on that's not as big of a risk? And then we'll recreate that. We'll start that process all over again, right? So you've answered the question in this in this part. So I would definitely do something to keep track of those. Uh, we you understand those uh, top portions right there where it talks about those key threat objectives that I discussed earlier, what do we look like, right? And then you develop an intelligence or the leadership, you have to get buy-in from your leadership. You can teach them how, what, how intelligence directives work. You can have them ask those questions and say, this is the kind of question you need to ask, but you don't tell them what question to ask. That's kind of like, uh, if you've worked in Intel before, you do not ask for the system, you ask for the capability, right? And that's the same thing here. You don't ask the question, you you tell them what kind of question to ask and if they need that help and tell teach them how to do this process, right? So in it, you can go ahead and say, okay, well, yeah, I went through the intelligence cycle, I've answered that question and it's complete. We've answered that question, let's move on. What's the other ones we haven't, we haven't uh, talked about? Maybe it's an undeveloped intelligence directive, maybe it's one that's currently being worked on and you keep track of that. I suggest doing that um it's something that i don't think a lot of cti programs do but that's a benefit of being a veteran is that you can sit here and you know some of uh for, for those who've worked in intel uh you've probably seen this process before maybe not the same way but you understand it uh it's it's understanding intelligence requirements and then actually working on it and answering those questions so this is just an, a, a good example operational level uh, this is going to help you with your day-to-day -day decision making. Uh, you know, what is the manager going to want to uh, have happen? Uh, where's you, you got to decide what resources you got to put out there? Developing tasks and prioritizing those tasks. Understanding the trends. Uh, this is we're not list, looking at things in a strategic, holistic way necessarily. Now we're looking at the trends that are occurring. Uh, you know, is it phishing emails that's 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 happening, and we need to go. Okay, well, uh, people are clicking on too many things. Uh, we need to talk to security awareness teams and say, hey, double check the email that's being, that's the sender data that's giving you an email if you find it suspicious or putting into your phishing, to, uh, phishing report tool that's part of your email uh, email network, email system. Um, you're, you're, if you're looking at things at a, an operational level concerning the threat, you're gonna understand that dire uh, technical direction itself. Uh, uh, what's the, what's, why did the target select you as an organization? Uh, and definitely that's part more involved with CTI rather than the other security teams, but you can understand a little bit uh, in, in developing uh, that information for the other teams and their understanding, because that's good information for them to have. Uh, I, I like to say that, you know, you've probably heard the term, if you're in the army, you've heard every soldier is a sensor, every, every member of your organization is a sensor. 
uh, you know, so for them to understand what you're looking for too is an intelligence team and, and being part of all teams. I think that's a good, a good thing to put out there is, you know, why is the adversary picking you? And then you identify those threats, uh, uh, identifying those threats that are out there on your network itself. And so a little bit of attribution and, and maybe uh, keeping an eye out for those, those naming conventions for each threat actor. There's several different ones. You'll see a whole bunch of loopy, crazy names. Uh, I wish there was more standardization when it came to that, but uh, it, it is what it is. <clears throat> At the operational level itself, let's think of it like this. So, uh, like I said, you want to, it's a continual process. You uh, identify itself, you use IOCs to identify what's going on. You develop a trend. You say there's a lot of uh, phishing emails regarding uh, invoices. It's looking for, there's a lot of uh, uh, phishing emails that say uh, something about an uh, invoice or a bill or a check that needs to be paid. Uh, and, and you say, well, that's a big issue for us. Okay, well, what's the objective they're trying to get? Are they trying to get, uh, are they maybe a threat actor that's trying to act like a peer organization or some kind of vendor that works for you, a third party that works with you that's in Canada? And they say, well, we need you to finalize this check that was supposed to be sent to us. Can you send it to us PayPal or uh, through a Western Union or something like that? And they do something like that to circumvent uh, some of those, some of those uh, blocks that are in the uh, uh, money transferring uh, processes, and and so you you kind of look at those and say, well, that's the objective is they want us to uh, send them money and do it in an alternative, easier way for them, but it's just because they want to uh, uh, circumvent those those things that wouldn't mitigate them getting their money. Uh, what's the collection sources? Once you understand those objectives, what are the collection sources you're going to get this information for uh, or from? And it's just a continual process. And so um, how do we disseminate that? You'll find as, a, as an intelligence person, uh, you'll get some ad hoc requests and ad hocs like your, your boss comes down and says, hey, I read this thing in the news. It says something about, uh, it says something about uh, social, somebody, social engineering people in the parking lot to, you know, piggyback in it, get their, you know, hey, I forgot my pass at home. There's been somebody walking around the parking lot trying to get into the buildings and say they want to piggyback on your on your access card and say, I just forgot at home and they try to social engineer their way in. You know, so let's find out a little bit more information about that. You didn't see anything externally about it. You didn't see anything internally in your network. It's something that your boss came up and asked you about. Uh, you can also look into developing trends. I suggest, and I do this every morning, as part of your daily role, go into the news. Find a couple of good sources and say, hey, is there, you know, a breach notification that came out from uh, uh, some organization? Is there what's in the news? What's some trend that's going on? Look and look for those things. Um, you you got to make sure that your your uh, your assessments kind of notarize that. So it gives you a little bit more confidence, your, your stakeholder, your client, uh, a little bit more confidence in your reporting if they say, hey, Here's what CrowdStrike put out—a big old, uh, you know, malware analysis report on the same thing that we're seeing, and you back up your information by doing that. In intelligence work, there's a lot of people that don't trust what you're putting out. They, you've heard the term before, military intelligence, you know, is a, is an oxymoron. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta create intelligence that, that uh, uh, makes makes people understand that truth is unimpeachable, right? But you have to provide that 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 truth, that fact. Uh, behind your behind your work, and sometimes that's through adding sources and building that confidence in what you're putting out is is correct. Uh, one of the ways that I told you before is that matter of fact is those uh, storyboards, and that covers, you know, what's the attacks that you observed, uh, what's the incidents that that uh, were uh, seen through the hunts, what is uh, the whole the whole life cycle that was identified. And you gain that uh, holistic understanding around those events that you've investigated and you put it out there in the operational level uh, reports themselves. And that may be something in the form of a threat bulletin, uh, an email sent to one of the managers and say, hey, TVM, uh, Threat and Vulnerability Management, uh, you know, hey, here's, I've been seeing this, uh, this vulnerability and it's got a rating of, let's say, six on most of the most of the 
uh, advisory uh, systems out there, but one of them is saying now it's a 9.8, you know, or what have you a nine, and you got to, you know, address that information through an email. Maybe it's just a regular report, you know, that you put out uh, just to the managers and say, hey, this is just a situational awareness report. And, and we wanted to let you know about it, that some guys walking around the parking lot and asking questions. And so just be, you know, a little cognizant of what's going on. Uh, to go back, actually back to the strategic level reporting, there's also a thing called, a, uh, if you've ever been in Intel before, or you worked in staff, you've done a read book. So you give your leadership a read book and that's kind of understanding, you know, what's going on. And it's just a book that you put in like maybe big subjects that are going on, any kind of threats uh, that you've read about in the news and, uh, and or just a short snippet of what you've been doing as, uh, as a team and you provide that to them. That's a good strategic level report to put out there is what I call the ISO read book or uh, CISO read book. Uh, operational level, you can do the same thing. So uh, tactical level intelligence, this is where that granular information, this is where you're working hard. This is where it all starts. You got, you got your first line uh, folks doing this. And that's just definitely uh, intel that influences tasks uh, that you want to be achieved and actioning on those things. Uh, uh, you have to implement some tasks uh, that can be just a singular one that needs to be put out to like a SOC guy. Uh, maybe it's a task for for everybody within your team, and it's it's very specific. Maybe it's an investigation into uh, folks that are kind of remote, uh, and and you have to have, uh, let's say, all architects that you have living in, or all engineers in Ukraine, and you're saying, hey, no more sharing information on GitHub, and anything that you're developing, you know, maybe that's that's something that you got to put out. It's a very specific thing that you have to concern yourself about. Okay. Um, so this kind of data when it regarding to the threat, uh, it, it's it's what information like IOCs, very specific granular information, uh, uh, maybe something that's seen in the repository, maybe it's something that's uh, information uh, regarding something that's out there in, in, a, in a marketplace. But like, hey, I went in the marketplace and I saw a whole bunch of emails with the uh, 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 TLD being from Christmas Island, or you know, the it's it's uh, it's got our you know inform it's got our company uh, dot com uh, at the end of it, but uh, you know they changed the lettering a little bit, so instead of a U, it's like an umpla or something like that, uh, uh, and you're you're kind of changing the. Uh, domain itself to look like a different letters, you know, these are very specific things, you know, you don't go up and tell your leadership that, your, your CISO that, like, hey, yeah, this, this, uh, this domain name that we saw had an oopla instead of a U, or it's in Cyrillic to look like uh, the letters in Cyrillic, and it looks like another letter, you know, so these things, you don't need to keep it uh, to put out at the, that level, you want to keep it at the tactical level, so they can action on it, look for it, and so what we do is let's say we find an IOC like a domain or something like that and uh, you do you go from there so you identify the IOC that you are looking for at tactical level and you report on it like I said before whenever you're doing the the uh, phishing report you find the IOCs you want to put those IOCs out there and they may be relevant but they may be irrelevant and let's say you find that IOC and okay well what's the action required uh, from this, okay, well, we're going to throw that IOC into virus total and see what it comes up with. And one thing I suggest if you ever go in, let's say you put IOC in uh, virus total, and then you see, uh, I think there's four different tabs, and it gives you kind of a summary, it kind of gives you anything related to it. But at the end of it, it says, you know, like comments or something like that. And sometimes you'll find those uh, fight club or security researchers uh, adding some comments on it and say, hey, here's what I found out. And that's a good thing to do. So you you can uh, actually get what actions you should take. Uh, and I don't suggest that you, uh, one thing that I should say is you don't really put out mitigation stuff. Uh, when I when I talked about you ask for the capability, not the, not the platform, it's the same thing here is that you're not really gonna put out the, you know, how do you mitigate this? that's going to be on your other teams to do. You're just providing the information of what it is. 
uh, and that's what Intel does, not operations. So Intel drives that operations. Operations is not driving that Intel. And so you, you can uh, discuss the action that was implemented. And, you know, by that point, there's got to be a decision point made or made by you or your leadership itself. And that's what tactical level is trying to do. You're building up from tactical level to the operational. And once you develop your operational, you're going to get your policy. And a good organization is not going to be top down. It's going to be bottom up refinement. Same thing in the military. If you don't have bottom up refinement, you are going to be a failed organization because any kind of leader just talking down to the organization and tell them exactly what they're going to do without intelligence is coming from the ground. If Washington DC just, we relied on Washington DC Intel analysts just to provide the Intel. And I'm sorry if any of you guys were, what do they know that Intel analysts in Afghanistan or Iraq or Syria or you know, anywhere else knows the guys that are dealing with Russia right now would, what would they, how would, how effective would their intelligence be if they just received it from, from DC? it would be failed, you know? And so we're doing that here through this building from tactical level. <clears throat> Excuse me, we're almost done with this intelligence cycle and we'll, we'll take a break. So at the tactical level, this is one of the things I, I wrote up uh, regarding auto, uh, uh, auto key fobs and how they send their signals out and how they change their megahertz. And it made it a little bit easier for uh, folks to do what they call uh, relay attacks. Um, one of the ways that they can fix it too, uh, I think this one uh, had to do with, you know, being able to use the manual key as opposed to the remote key. But tactical level, this is going to tell you what the, this is breaking down things in a very granular fashion. And you'll see that when we discuss the MITRE tech framework and the difference and more, you know, how that information is relevant. So what, what you try to do is you can provide what I call a cyber threat bulletin, which is usually done in like an email form. You can do it that you do a small PDF, but it's not like you doing an assessment on the information. You are stating matters of fact and putting in a quick like snippet, like guys walking around the parking lot, dropping, uh, dropping little uh, storage, uh, uh, you know, storage devices out here that look like, you know, they're candy wrappers or something, you know, so something to indicate, you know, to, to lure somebody to do an action. So, you know, you, you may have that little bit of granular information that you provide out and that could be put in the form of a threat bulletin. It's giving you a very, sum, you want to provide a very summarized snort, short snippet of what you're trying to say, but also adding that technical data that they're going to need. Uh, you know, you've got a, a, imposter uh domain that's out there and you're like okay well we got to contact the the person that is who uh developed that domain and have them shut it down uh maybe you're doing a working group and you know uh you're trying to gather all that tactical uh information and you're sharing information with socks socks and sharing information with you socks sharing information with the hunt team and that's all that technical data that you're actually, we talk about actionable intelligence. Uh, somebody had that question earlier. That's what I mean. Actionable intelligence is IOCs. It's this very specific information that requires an action to do so, to, to, to take on that. Uh, and, and a good way to do this, share their information is through a CTI working group. So <clears throat> like I said before, all of this process itself has a uh all this process has itself has to have that feedback and refinement and say you go through the intelligence cycle and you've done your internal intelligence collection you married it up with the external intelligence out there and you do not know uh you know this isn't quite fitting what you think it's supposed to or it's like a dry hole you know you don't you don't have the ability to uh do anything further or it's the wrong information you can stop at any point in this intelligence cycle and go back and start over again. One of the biggest mistakes that people make in intelligence is they do this thing called, I call it the Godzilla theory. You know, you imagine the worst thing that's gonna happen and it sounds really good on paper. Like, hey boss, there's this huge lizard monster that's coming out of the ocean and he's gonna attack the whole city and he's gonna take everything over and kill everybody. And I told you about it, so I should get rewarded, right? You know, or I look really good. You want that, uh, um, uh, it's a, it's almost like a, a, instead of getting positive feedback from it from it, you're getting 
providing that bad information, which you think will be rewarding instead of, uh, instead of positivity bias, it's negativity bias, because you're giving that negative information, uh, which makes you look good. You think my deal, my deal as an Intel guy is I'm supposed to report all the bad things and you provide this big bad and it doesn't matter. It doesn't meet timely. It doesn't mean actual, it doesn't make relevant. And you know, it doesn't make any sense. And an Intel community has done this forever. That's why we get a lot of training in bias and logical fallacies and understanding critical thinking. Uh, that's why it's so important in an intelligence program to do those things. So we avoid the Godzilla theory. Uh, and if you see that at any point in your intelligence cycle, go back. It's feedback and refinement. Get feedback from your peer. Do peer reviews and everything like that. So all this decision making drives the intelligence production, and and you have to uh, you have to be able to refine that information and make sure that you are informing your stakeholders in the most effective way. A complete and mature cyber program uh, utilizes this model uh, to holistically and thoroughly collect and assess all that information. And with a mature CTI program, stakeholders can take proactive and inf uh, informed action uh, on their respective tasks and objectives. And with that, I am going to put you guys on a uh, let's let's do a ten minute a ten minute break, and I'll get into maturity models uh, for a CTI program, and we'll go from there. I'm gonna stop sharing for a, for a minute. See if you guys had any questions. Yeah. All right. So, next section I'm talking about maturity uh, maturity models. What I did was I did an analysis. I talked to a bunch of organizations uh, to include ones like Target and some of our peer organizations that I had when I worked for uh, Enterprise. I don't think I really covered that uh, before. I, I worked for uh, a few organizations, um, uh, one being Enterprise as an Enterprise Rent-A-Car. Uh, I worked for Equifax uh, and, and worked on uh, their teams as kind of an all source intelligence analyst. Uh, so I worked in the insider threat intelligence program and I worked into uh, the cyber threat intelligence program. There was a difference there uh, based on what they wanted to do. And um, now I work for a company called First Sprite and uh, I run, I manage the threat intelligence group and in it, uh, we do everything from, uh, you know, uh, threat and vulnerability management stuff. Uh, we do uh, VSOC, VCISO and stuff. So uh, what I try to look at when I talk about maturity models uh, for an intelligence program is how effectively you're working, what kind of tools you have and what kind of products you're putting out and where are you at, you know? And, and so my experience was from uh, my time at Enterprise and Equifax, is you know developing a program and seeing what what is considered a mature program, and so uh, this is where I kind of developed uh, uh, regarding that. So, at the first level, if you're going to start a CTI program or you have one, you're starting off. Um, it's it's very basic. There's some two tracks that you can go to, and as, as we're talking about veterans and or being a veteran and everything, a service member and you're kind of getting into cybersecurity, I, I, want to, I want to tell you that you take this model and you kind of identify where you're at, or if you're going to develop a program, where do I start off at? Uh, you don't want to get your, you know, uh, you know, the cart before the horse. So <clears throat> kind of utilize this. This is based off of uh, several organizations and their idea of a maturity model and kind of my own uh, when I was asked this question, what does a mature program look like? So uh, I talked to a bunch of them. I talked to uh, the retail and hospitality, ISAC, information security, or information sharing uh, groups. And this is kind of uh, what I came up through, uh, you know, going through a scale of one to four, and four definitely being the most uh, mature. So if you have an immature program itself, uh, where I talk about the difference between data, information, or investigation itself, and intelligence. <clears throat> Are you collecting data? Are you strictly collecting? Uh, are you doing an investigation? Do you even have an intelligence function? Uh, there's two tracks, like I said, when uh, you, versus we're dealing with veterans and service members. In CTI and some other cybersecurity groups, but definitely with CTI, you can have somebody who comes up from the help desk or the SOC 
and then they eventually get into incident response or DLP, D uh, data loss prevention, uh, or incident response. Um, and then, or security engineering. I've had some guys come from security engineering and then they get into CTI or they go into the lab where you have a reverse engineer and they do some stuff for CTI. So those folks may not have the, come from the intelligence community. That's why I've tailored this this to kind of go over my own experience coming from the intelligence community into cybersecurity. Uh, I made it this way because I'm taking your strengths as a service member, as a veteran, and maybe former uh, member of the intelligence community, or you know how the intelligence community works uh, from your time time in service, and you apply it to a cybersecurity job. If you started off in cybersecurity, you went to college, you went to the SOC, right? You know, a help desk or what have you, and you moved up that ladder I just talked about, your track is going to be a little bit different. Your understanding and your of how to do intelligence is going to be a little bit different. That's why some of these guys who came from or to maybe teach other intelligence programs are a little bit different from what I'm going to cover, uh, what I've covered and what I will cover here for the rest of the workshop. In that, I wanted you to know that you have a strength that you can create a mature program uh, but at first you got to identify where you're at right now so at the first one the usually immature program uh, is just collecting through invest doing investigative part getting internal data maybe they buy a feed and they're pulling in that that is their external and they're relying very heavily on that and maybe they're just looking at blocking and alerting. So they're very heavy on the indicators of compromise and just plugging that into their tool. And then that's what they can, they call intelligence. Uh, what they definitely need to do now from that point is give that, provide that context that so what, uh, try to use more uh, external intelligence to build the confidence in your internal intelligence and learn how to write. And that's where you're going to get into the next stage of the two uh, level two, a basic, not an immature, but a basic CTI program where you now you're, you're focusing on that first or the second section of uh, the intelligence cycle of intelligence collection and not really covering the intelligence analysis part, you know, the analysis part. You're just collecting the information. You don't know quite know how to refine it and you don't know how to properly structure it in the, in the right way. Uh, maybe you are actioning on IOCs. Uh, you do have the internal and external function of intelligence uh, collection. Uh, maybe you can correlate your threats. You can do a little uh, 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 attribution itself, and uh, you'll be able to brief your security teams around you, uh, maybe in the hallway, maybe in a meeting, but you're not really creating a lot of products because you're not getting to that third stage of analysis necessarily. You're just like, here's the data I collected. Here's the investigation found. Here's the here's the here's what I get, uh, found out about it. So what you need to do more is you need to get into those parts that I think is a strength for veterans is this understanding behavior and adversaries themselves. It's a very very tough task with an intelligence community to understand an adversary and and the nature of things. That's something that we don't you know that you may be getting into the technical granular part whenever you come up that track from uh, from maybe college or your your school and then getting into cybersecurity that you may not get that that kind of training but veterans and service members do uh, is understanding bad guys that's what we do right and so we understand adversary behavior we got to be able to know how to uh, develop trends to get to that next uh, next area because you're not just collecting all that granular data now you're getting into understanding a more holistic matter uh, in critical thinking they call uh, granular thinking, they call it um, spotlight thinking. You're focused on one little area, kind of like mathematics, right? You're only focused on those very specific things that don't really change into, uh, and you're not, let's say you're looking at the diamond model, you're understanding the adversary, and then you understand the, uh, you know, the, the, um, the infrastructure that was on, the platform was on, the weaponization, and maybe you understand the victim, but you don't understand the relationship in between. So that's very spotlight thinking. Uh, uh, when we're talking about critical thinking, but if you do what we call floodlight thinking or holistic thinking rather than granular, you understand that relationship and that diamond model. And as an intelligence program, when you go to the next step, you need to understand that. So in this, we're doing more of analysis and an analysis is you're now analyzing those bits of information in that puzzle piece and you're putting it together. 
And so you're understanding the relationship. Okay, well, this, you know, if you're doing a puzzle, you understand that this piece has the same color, has kind of a similar shape, and it has a straight edge. You know, it's it's these things that you're understanding the nature of it, and you're putting putting it together, uh, and, and you're understanding trends and their intent and everything. Uh, so this program consists of those products influencing the next investigation. Uh, we're like, hey, this is a really nice investigation. I think by external intelligence, this is a bigger problem than what we think uh, for this one little incident, this one little set of phishing emails. Maybe it's broader and they pivoted and it's just a little bit of a change, but now we can see there's a relationship there. Maybe there's a malware author that's been providing the same malware, but it's different senders. You know, So you may be thinking it's different groups because it's different kind of senders or different methodology for initial access, but now you're like, well, no, the malware is the same. It does it once it gets past the initial access, all the behaviors are the same. They're looking at active active directory. It's you know low and slow. It's looking uh, you know it's providing uh, uh, emails that are maybe they're sending a fake splash page, and they're looking for that clickable trigger on your email, and it's very unstructured. It's very you can tell it's fake, or you can tell it's really good. It looks exactly like what Microsoft would put out. And you're like, oh crap, this is real. Okay, all right, I, I, bet, I guess better click it. Boom, you're done, right? So understanding these uh, these things and being able to read the threat or the risky things that you you identify uh, and, and being able to go, okay, well, yeah, this is more of, uh, I can understand this whole thing here and something is off those unknown unknowns, we better check this out. And then you figure out it is actually something bad. At this point in an advanced CTI program, you'll be able to do that because you're analyzing that information properly. You're also getting collaboration with uh, a good effective program would get collaboration with other members of the uh, uh, CTI or intelligence sharing uh, community <clears throat> and working in fusion groups. You as a CTI person can't be necessarily, you might not be an expert on how to do SOC. Okay, I only did sock for a little bit. Um, maybe I have never hunted, you know, maybe you never never done a hunt before. Maybe those security engineering portion that you don't understand because it's too of a specific uh, 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 discipline that you don't know under, understand the complexity of it. And so having a, a fusion group with those guys that are like mind but different disciplines, it would be ideal to have in a, in a program at this at this state. Uh, but what you're missing out is is now you be able to provide that intelligence, but now let's provide that intelligence and see from based off the trends of what could occur now uh, coming up. So you're providing proactive intelligence. Uh, you're getting buy-in now at the uh, leadership level, the stakeholder level, and you're getting the other teams to send your RFIs, requests for information on things that they may, may, you know, you're getting them in the intelligence mindset and saying, this is good information for me to have. And they're sending you RFIs. You're getting that direction from your CISO and saying, hey, these are the things, these are the intelligence requirements the, that I identified based off your key threat objectives report. And this is what I want to look for. These are the questions I want to ask. You're getting that buy-in from leadership. Those two things are one of the hardest things to get. If you're an effective CTI program if, at the advanced level, that's when you start getting it. And, and that's because you're providing timely, relevant, and actual intelligence. <clears throat> and you're getting that buy-in saying, this is a good CTI program. If I'm going to be effective, Infor, uh, information security or uh, uh, information security uh, uh, group, then I'm going to involve my Intel Intel team, and I'm going to do what they want, and I'm going to do it the right way, because whatever was, they're providing us is working. And so, <clears throat> once you get into that, you're going to get that buy-in. You're going to get those intelligence requirements or the uh, the, the uh, um, intelligence directives and everything. And you, at, at this next level, you're providing everything current, relevant, timely, actionable. Um, and you get you feed, that feedback. So at this level, uh, you're, com you're complete. Everybody's working together. Your intelligence is well-defined. The dissemination of the product is being well-received. Um, your intelligence is, is, is definitely proactive. And you're constantly questioning yourself and whether this is good maybe we need to go back we talk about refinement and feedback these are this is where it works is at this level if you can do the intelligence cycle effectively the whole way this is where your mature program and this is where you need to be and you understand yourself 
uh, your security posture as an organization too. And you're able to produce intelligence products up and down the level. So uh, I'm gonna check and see if there's any questions involving. This is the first portion uh, of, of how to create a CTI program. And now I'm gonna show you some of the, the work that goes behind it. It's not too granular uh, until we kind of get into uh, frameworks. It's a little bit more technical, but not anything that you guys wouldn't be able to understand. So I'm gonna check and see if we got any questions real quick. <clears throat> Let's see here. Anybody got any questions? No? All right. Then we are going to move on. Okay. I know it's kind of around lunchtime, so we're gonna have a little bit more fun uh, if I if I can. So <clears throat> why do bad guys do bad things? This is a very important thing to understand. Um, if I could, CTI, you do not just worry about what's what you're seeing on the network. I'm not saying do attribution to the point where you're going and, and hacking back or anything like that. You need to understand that bad guys do bad things. Uh, and, and, you know, it, when I talk about advising or being the ambassador to the threat free organization, as a service member or veteran, you need to understand this because this is what this is the value added to, that that uh, force multiplier that you provide. To a CTI, to an intelligence program itself, is you understand bad guys. You've seen the worst of it. Uh, some folks here in the states who have never been to military, maybe not, maybe don't quite understand it. Uh, you understand the methodology and and, and everything because we've been trained to do so. If you've been intelligence, you understand this, and this is the value added that you bring. So, <clears throat> why do bad guys do bad things? As a security professional, your number one task is to keep bad guys failing and keep the good guys winning, right? And so we do our best to understand who they are, why they're doing it, what they do, and what's their weaknesses and strengths, because that's exactly what they're doing to you, right? It's conflict. Conflict is 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 the back and forth. Uh, in this portion, we're going to talk about direction because understanding the bad guys and understanding yourself is part of the direction portion of of the uh, intelligence cycle, right? I'm showing my age a little bit. If you remember this movie. Uh, I think it was called The Last Dragon. That's that bad character show enough, right? Hey, you gotta, he's, a, he's a bad dude. You got to understand why bad guys do bad things. Are they wanting power in the movie? He wanted power that he doesn't possess. He wants uh, uh, fame, right? So you got to understand why people do the things that they do. And that's what we're going to dive into. Does anybody know who this bad guy is? Now, it's make, this works a little bit easier whenever I have a live audience. I'm sorry that you guys can't answer back necessarily, but that's uh, that's not Julian Assange. That's the bad guy from Die Hard. That's Julian Assange. Okay, uh, we, so we have Julian Assange, uh, famous for share, uh, leaking information uh, through WikiLeaks, uh, got in trouble and has been locked up for quite a long time. Uh, so he's probably he'll, he'll probably be in prison for the rest of his life. I I don't keep updated on him lately, but uh, that one is Chelsea Manning, formerly Bradley Manning. Uh, he was, if I remember correctly, part of the 10th Mountain Division. Uh, he was an intel analyst, an all source analyst. Uh, uh, she, he, she. Um, and I've remember seeing the, some of the, a lot of the details and information that he, he gave out. Um, and that was a very impactful for um, the Army. And it, it put a lot of lives at risk. And I think at some points uh, caused some people to. Uh, suffer. Um, this guy, I remember, is part of is, uh, Sabu, I think it's Lulsec. And if I remember correctly, this is Jeremy or Jason Hammond. Uh, I, I talked to the DHS folks who actually arrested him. Uh, interesting story is that uh, I believe he was in a high rise uh, building in Chicago and uh, where they, you know, came in there and there was just trash everywhere. Right. These are a lot of anarchist kind of folks, you know, anarchy kind of folks. 
and all this trash was everywhere and everything and you'd see like mcdonald's bags and stuff like that and just all this computer equipment and uh he said the weirdest thing was there was money crumpled up somehow they would get money and all this money was crumpled up into little places uh and just thrown with trash because it didn't necessarily matter to him until it was a necessity um and it's just kind of that that whole you know f the world kind of mentality that they maintained uh so these are the these are some of the personalities and you got to understand what's the motivations behind each one i'm sorry i keep hearing uh some beef so i want to make sure um yeah yeah so moving on here okay so why do bad gays do bad things right okay um so one of the things i like to dive into is okay let's understand why uh, uh what's the motivations behind certain certain folks and here's, here's some big big ones here uh julian assange uh had the uh online name of mindax and it comes from a, a story uh, uh i think it was a father and his uh he had several daughters uh and everything and one of the tricks was i think he had to uh have his daughter marry uh, one of his enemies or something like that. And what happened was that she married this man. She was forced into that marriage. Uh, uh, splendid A. Mendax, I think is the story behind that. And it means splendid liar because she married the uh, the father's enemy and uh, actually came back and was against, you know, with the, her new husband and plotted against the, the father, if I remember his story correctly. So it means splendid liar um or brilliant liar that can kind of give you an indication of what you know the naming convention that they have uh online their online you know tagline code name whatever you want to call it and why that why that matters right um edward snowden uh had one called Ver verax uh means truth teller um to him his motivation may have been that no matter what the truth is if it was dangerous risky or what have you it needed to be out there and that kind of gives you an indication of what you can expect from somebody like that these are just examples i'm not here to get political with anything uh i'm just trying to state what we know right uh like i said julian yeah it was uh julian's mother was big literature and uh in one of the stories it was horace's 50 daughters yeah who were uh going to be forced to marry and horace planned that his daughters to uh kill their new husbands and one of them uh the, she let her husband lived and turned on the father and so they named uh he named it after uh splendid a mendax meaning splendidly false or splendid liar so one of the best ways i would say is we talk about frameworks and everything uh let's talk about why people do the things that they do um so let's think of it as uh the bad actor and you know if you have if you get into criminality, you get into investigations, and if you've been in law enforcement or anything like that, or you've been in social work, you kind of understand Maslow's hierarchy of needs and its relevancy to why crime occurs. And, you know, hacking and everything is a crime, cyber crime, right? Are you expecting to see cyber threat actors just worried about the first level of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs? is just survival and getting shelter shelter food warmth or water right probably not there have been you know if we think about the jason or jeremy hammonds uh uh that i just discussed and them just throwing money out maybe they you know they needed a little bit of money to get some food and they, so they rob an atm that may occur uh, but not typical usually it's just like other more violent crimes where lower level you are on maslow's hierarchy of needs the more emotional you can become on doing your ends ways and means of whatever you're doing uh the, the the threat landscape itself and so you may see more violent crime as opposed to cyber crime and yes cyber crime can become violent in a way 
we won't get into details. I won't do the so what's or the what ifs. Um, but here, survival's not really not really about that. So these are the needs part of 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 Maslow's hierarchy of needs. More if you ever have if you have kids like me, you say, is that a need or a want? Sometimes when you get around belonging and importance and self-actualization, those become more wants and needs. We need security. If you've been in a leader uh, in the mil, if you're a leader in the military, you understand. You know, you want chow, you want water, you want mail, you want shelter, and and all that stuff, right? And ammo, right? So, you, you, those are needs. Here we kind of talk about what's a security need, and it's definitely security, but it's also stability. Uh, you know, you hack into an ATM because you need more money so you can pay your bills. You've been, you know, wasting money at gambling and you need to make sure that your mortgage is paid for. So you may falsify a check or make a deposit that's not 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 real. Or, you know, you might ha hack somebody's uh, uh, credit card information. And so you try to gain that financial, get that financial gain. And so you try to uh, do that and avoid, uh, have the freedom away from fear. Um, and that's where we get kind of in that security section. And that's where you might start seeing some of these more cyber crimes happening more financially than anything else. <clears throat> Maybe it's belonging. Has, uh, I think there's a, uh, a lady named Eva, who's uh, a great uh, leader uh, within cybersecurity. Uh, I can't, I'm sorry, I don't remember her name off the top of my head, but she does a lot of that. Uh, you know, if you're, you have an ex-boyfriend that hacked your phone and put a tracker on it and is reading your stuff and, and everything, or you have some, you know, ex, ex or, or somebody that's cyber stalking, thank you, or cyber stalking that's occurring. And that might be why the reason why that's occurring. Uh, maybe you're worried about, you know, you had a divorce and you're worried about your kids and you put that system on your, your wife's phone or your ex-wife's phone or, or what have you. Those are the kind of things that you're looking for. Um, maybe you get into uh, doing some OSINT on somebody that you met at a club or something like that, and you start diving a little bit more further, and you're like, oh, crap, let me try their password out and see if that works. You know, that's where these things of, of belonging is because you want to know more about that one person and keep track of them. And it's not necessarily from a place from a, what do you think uh, the third actor can think it's coming from a place of love can be from a place of hate and fear and violence. And and that's when when this occurs is, is that belonging. Uh, yeah, I think that some people use the term of, uh, for a lot of uh, violent acts that are occurring now, they use the term incel for, was it involuntarily celibate? Uh, this is where that, in Maslow's hierarchy needs, you might find folks that kind of use that, uh, that, that fit into that category, if that's the terminology you, you use. And like I said, I'm not getting political with anybody. That's just, you know, what what's current, right? Uh, so matter of fact it may be thinking it's place from love that they're they're doing something because they wanted to have friends uh i think that guy that shot up um the shot the school in st louis that's what he was putting out he's he's saying i didn't belong with anybody i've never had a girlfriend and things of that sort and and, and you see that happening and that may be a cause for violence but it might well be for, uh, a cause for cyber crime itself now we get into more of the wants Maybe you have security and survival, uh, you have shelter and everything, and you have relationships and all that stuff, but you want to have some kind of self-importance that's going on. You want to feel good about yourself. You want to have that job. I know uh, there's been incidents where guys have uh, uh, got into systems and tried to steal ideas from other folks that you know, maybe they wanted to have this idea for themselves and they transitioned to a company. This self-importance is where you kind of get more insider threats. Um, you do have insider threats that occur at the security and belongings area, but you also get it here more in the self-importance area uh, with guys that work within cybersecurity because they want to be able to get that new job. They want to keep climbing that ladder, right? They want to achieve. They want to get that self-respect, but maybe they don't have the skill set to develop things on their own, you know? So that's when that kind of crime more occurs. Self-actualization. This is where we get in more of the uh, Julia Assange, the man, Earl Manning's kind of uh, um, more in the belonging area, uh, I, I believe. And, and the more Julian Assange and uh, Snowden, I think, is in the self actualization, is like, you know, 
am I solving a problem of communications within the intelligence community or bad things that are occurring out in the world? Uh, maybe, you know, some, uh, some organizations or nation states got too much power and that's maybe why he decided to do what he did, right or wrong. That's, I'm just talking from his perspective and being an intelligence guy and speaking from where I think that he's coming from. Uh, that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to solve the problem of too many bad intel or too many intelligence programs uh, having too much power and that's way, the way of his thinking, uh, whether legitimate or not. Uh, with the same thing with Julian Assange, I, I think that his was for the purpose of that whole Splendid Day Mendax, you know, uh, putting, you know, being splendidly false and trying to, trying to uh, get one over on other folks uh, by, by hacking them and showing them for what they're, maybe they, maybe he thinks that they're doing something bad and he's trying to put the, the information out there because he thinks that all information belongs to the whole world. And so he's doing it for that, for, for influence, you know, so those things occur and that's why, you know, bad actors uh, do the things that they do in this framework itself. Maslow's hierarchy of needs fits that very well. And I think that you should learn it as part of your intelligence training uh, because it keeps things simplified. You are creating these things or you're using these things like Maslow's hierarchy of needs and some of the other frameworks that I'm going to discuss to build muscle memory, your brain muscle, uh, uh, develop that muscle memory so you know the, any situation. And I'll give you an, an, an actual uh, idea of this. If I was, well, I was doing intelligence information on Iraq and I said, okay, well, what are all the threat groups? That was the question, the intelligence directive I was given. What are the threat groups that are exist in Iraq? Holy crap, if I didn't see like, you know, 1500 different threat groups that existed in Iraq itself, everything from the nation states, uh, nation states army to you know, criminal gangs to, uh, you know, the different uh, uh, different tribes or what have you, even Afghanistan, uh, you had all these different tribes and families and everything. And then you had, you know, the national threat actors and outside actors. But if you tried to apply their motivations, intent, in-state objectives, everything per each group and broken down, you were going to be a very busy person trying to write all that, develop that. So use these frameworks to kind of put in and see, well, which groups are very similar. And that actually can lead you into uh, going, well, these are the same organizations. They're just a different name. And you see that in cybersecurity from everything from like, uh, you know, uh, crowd stakes, crowd strikes, naming conventions, you know, with spider and kitten. And, you know, if you put a, uh, you know, a color before it or whatever naming convention you want to provide, Doing that, you might be able to go, hey, you know, APT 51 is the same thing as, you know, Purple Tiger, you know, and you know that by putting it in a framework. Uh, that's that's kind of the why we do the things that we do here in, in Maslow's Hierarchy Needs is because we want to understand the bad actor and why they're doing what they do. Um, and and what's, the, what's the motivation and drive? And we'll get into that when I talk more about insider threats. So it's all about a persona. Uh, you're identifying the patterns of life. Um, one of the best books that I've ever read is this one here. And I know it seems like a comic nerd thing, but is one of the best books that I've ever read when it comes to understanding uh, psychology and personas. Um, I, 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 can't, I can't tell you enough how important this has been for my, my, my intelligence career. Uh, and you know, I got to listen to it while running on a treadmill. <laughs> you know? um, one of the bigger points is a mask or being a criminal or a threat actor on cy in cyber uh, security world means that you have anonymity. That's why attribution is so important. You got to understand who the threat actor is and why it's such a difficult thing to plug it to, you know, a, a threat to an actual person but you can understand its motivations. I, I hunt, right? And if I hunt, I don't go hunting for Bob the deer. I don't sit here and go, well, Bob gets up at, you know, nine o'clock in the morning and goes down to the water here at this, uh, you know, Indian Creek and he likes to chew on, you know, uh, you know, whatever alfalfa or what have you. I don't do that. As a hunter, you decide, Okay, well, based on life patterns and trends and trend analysis, 
uh, you know, a deer will try to find a, you know, an easy path to walk through while having cover, a, you know, a cover and concealment or what have you. And it, you know, likes to travel while it's at dusk and a little, you know, low light and, and so on. And they can hear really well and they can smell really well. So you got to, you know, drive what you're doing towards that because you're not going to understand individual deers. You're going to understand how deers work in nature. And that's the same thing with uh, the threat groups that I had to deal with in Iraq and in ones in Afghanistan. Uh, when I had to ride up for Iraq, I'd never been to Iraq, but uh, I'd, I'd been to uh, Afghanistan a couple of times. So in this, we try to understand uh, that when we talk about superheroes and bad guys that they wear masks and their behaviors change when they put on that mask. That's because anonymity is, is, is drives people to be uh, different and it uh, creates what they call de-individuation, uh, getting rid of you as an individual. You are, you are a thing as opposed to, or, a, or an idea as opposed to a person, an individual. And when you do that and you think that you, nobody can point to you as an individual, it causes disinhibition, sorry. Uh, so you're not inhibited by your behavior or your behavior is not inhibited anymore because nobody can point to you and come, come back to you uh, against who you are. And because of that, uh, uh, those kind of things are also driven in the criminal culture through drugs or fatigue. Maybe you're really tired and your behaviors change itself. Maybe it's the atmosphere you're at. Maybe you'd act different in the club than you would at church, right? Uh, maybe it's the encouragement, the group think that you have, or the hive, you, know, you can say hive mind, you know, those things kind of occur. So when you have a persona as, to refer, as, as opposed to an individual, there's a lot of factors to think about. You're not as conscious of what your, what your, what your uh, actions are because the group's doing it. You can be nudged, as they say, into doing a certain action. You'd be aroused, you know, you may be aroused to do more violent acts or or so uh, something of that sort. Maybe you're very aggressive as opposed to your more calm self. Uh, maybe you're taking a lot more risk. Uh, you're definitely diffused from responsibility and your self-awareness is to completely diminished because it is not the behavior of the individual individual. It is the behavior of the persona or the group that you're with. So I like to talk about society itself. And once we talk about groups, once you were in a group, you talk about society and society is made up of all the different groups rather than the individuals. And so these things occur where you see drastic changes in behavior and how they act. Um, you see this with anonymous. Uh, one thing that I didn't touch on and when I talked about the Batman psychology thing, one of the things they discussed is when people put on masks, when they changed into their persona, their behavior changes. And they talked about, I think it was a Stanford experiment where they had people dress up as nurses and they had people dress up as uh, criminals or patients. And they had to provide electric shocks or, or, or what have you, or they strap them in and they check, check the behaviors of what they did when they were put in the certain uniforms or masks. So when they put a pillowcase on their head and they put them in more of a, uh, a pillowcase on, on the uh, person applying the uh, shocks or putting them in the chair, or taking care of them or whatever it was, they were more violent and bossy. If you wore more of a military, military police and law enforcement uniform, they were more uh, uh, given direction and not as, not as uh, caring and nurturing. They were just like, get in this chair, put this on. And they would strap down harder uh, the person into the bed or they put cuffs on and they were more violent and more aggressive. Uh, not saying that because they were dressed as a law enforcement officer, they would do that. But when they came from a point of authority rather than a point of care in that uniform or that persona, their actions and behaviors changed. Uh, and that's what they talked about with uh, Batman and the, the rogue gallery of criminals uh, is that whenever they put on that mask, their behaviors significantly change into whether it's going to be violent or they're protective because when those guys in that stanford experiment those folks in that stanford ex experiment put on nursing or medical uniforms they were asking you know how are you doing how are you feeling and things like that when it comes to cybercrime and your threat actor the anonymity is going to drive their behaviors a lot more because if it's an individual just doing it their actions are going to change if they're in a group and they're doing these actions they'll be more drastic more risky and more violent or uh, more, uh, uh, you know, damaging in their in their actions. So we need to understand once they're in a group, once they have a persona, and they have anonymity, 
and they become more uh, groups to make up a society. And if those groups themselves are unstable and conflicting with society, uh, that's going to be a definite big uh, condition uh, for conflict. I'm going to check time and check comments right quick before we get to this next section. Yeah, definitely cyberbullying. So I used to run a nonprofit that uh, helped find missing and exploited children. Uh, if you ever get the chance, you're doing OSINT and you do, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, trace labs. If you get a chance, do participate in the capture of flags of trace labs and help find missing persons. As a service member, you get done. That's one thing I had to do is I had to find a way to continue to serve because it's going to be for your mental health. Uh, especially for those who've been to combat, continue serving, continue exercising. Because if you just sit there and you act like you're retired and you can put your feet up and you don't have any any outlet, you are going to likely have uh, some issues, whether it be your, your phys physical health or your mental health. And so one of the things that I did was you could participate in things like, I think uh, there's Team Red, White, and Blue, which does exercise activity instead of some other organizations that focus more on alcohol drinking and getting together and having, you know, cookouts and stuff like that. Um, those things serving, continue serving through cybersecurity uh, is an important thing. And I definitely suggest that. And in this chat, if you're part of some of those organizations and you want to invite people, go ahead and do so. That's why we're here at VetsatCon, right? Is, is it so we can do that. And so that's one of the things that I did is I started an organization to help find missing exploited children and that helped me out with my mental uh, and I felt like I was still contributing because the, the mission's not over right and that's why kind of why we're here so um, if I could continue uh, unstable society definitely a precondition for conflict I'll talk about Clausewitz uh, he was a great uh, military thinker and most of everything you guys did in the military and their strategic understanding was based off of this you've been to staff college you've been to uh, um, what's that one out in Kansas uh, for the army? It's, it's basically like you guys are um, the people that go there are like the Jedi's of, of uh, military planning and everything. Uh, this is kind of where you've come to learn about Clausewitz and everything. So that's where I'm getting into now. When Clausewitz discuss society and you're like, what does this have to do with cyber? It has everything to do because the actions that are taken by your threat actors are driven by what they're they're trying to do to affect this trinity that represents your society or your nation state or whatever you know whatever country or whatever this is this is what the complete makeup is now i'm not going to get into the 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 more military application of it i want you to understand it from a pragmatic sense an understandable sense and and be able to apply it so at the top there you have governance government uh, in the blue, you have security, and in the yellow, you have the people. Every society has this. You have a government, you have the people that, that are, uh, you know, represented or controlled by the, by the government, and the government uses the security forces to either help out, assist, or in bad cases, tamp down the, the people, and the people are supposed to represent. This is supposed to be a good representation through, uh, what, you know, a republic understanding of of society is that the people hire the government, the government has hires, you know, is control of the security and the security controls the people. But if that gets out of whack, and let's say that the government is getting out of control, and then it takes the security forces and the people to work together to control back, get back control of the government itself, that maybe it's an autocracy or something like that, they can be more autocratic or, or what have you, where they fall into anarchy, you got to get uh, control of that government. And that's done through those two other entities. What I try to say is uh, when an outside actor, and we'll think of it more of in cybersecurity needs, uh, tries to affect a society, they're doing it through fear, chaos, you know, propaganda. You've seen that uh, definitely around elections. We're around election season. You see a lot of that occurring, fear and chaos and propaganda, but also operational reach. How are... Uh, let's say Russia, you know, thought they were, you know, the Nord Stream 2 thing was attacked. And now they're like, okay, well, let's start doing some operational reach against our, you know, not just cyber uh, attacks, but let's do some operational reach and shut down some industrial systems. 
uh, uh, you know, read a lot of stuff coming out of Dragos and you see this kind of thing applied because you're, you, you want to see how cyber is applied to uh, big industries and your energy sectors and stuff like that. And that can cause a lot of fear and chaos because you're not going to know when your food's going to get to your next plate. Skip three meals and you got anarchy. That's, that's, that's what a lot of folks say. Um, if you don't know where your next three meals are, it, it, it can be affected significantly in a short bit of time. Uh, so all this is applied here and you try to, uh, an outside actor tries to influence your society, your society's trinity uh, by the, by those factors. Uh, so what I did was uh, when studying this, I kind of took what um, I learned from Machiavelli's book on discourses. And yes, people can say, well, he's an evil person. Uh, you know, the prince and, and everything was an evil book. But this guy, you're talking about a guy who was just an intel guy. He was given uh, advice based on of uh, whatever person they were advising, whether it be a king, whether it be a republic, whether it be a democracy, or, or, or you know what have you. And so he came up with this idea. And discourses is actually what kind of uh, the book that led to uh, I think Thomas Paine's uh, creation of the book Discourses, just rewritten to be more fitting towards uh, you know our new republic and everything when we got started. And he had the idea, and I'm going to break it down, the whole book basically into this little structure here. But he laid out the evolution of governance in his book. And there's always exceptions to the rule. But that being said, this theory follows the neural path of human behavior in civilized societies. And it gives you a basic outline of how many nations and states have come and gone. And there are three stages for which each one is formed. Uh, uh, there's, I mean, sorry, there are three stages uh, within each form that's this ruled. They have the functional state, the point of destabilization, and the point of transformation. These stages are, are, are a form and cause, a form of cause and effect. So each form of governance changes into the next one, typically in sequential order, from an autocratic to a republic to democracy to an anarchy, and eventually back to an autocratic. Uh, the listed elements of each stage are commonplace in each form of governance. If one looks at almost every country that has transitioned from its former rule, they will see this form, uh, they will see a form of these elements occurring. Uh, you've heard the terms, or you've heard the saying like, um, sh you know, hard times create, you know, hard men or strong men. Strong men create good times and uh, good times create weak men and weak men create uh, hard times. That's kind of what we're talking about here. And I don't mean just men, but people. <laughs> so I'll let you read kind of through this. I'll give you a little bit of time to look at it. I'm not going to read it verbatim, um, but I'll cover a, a, a little bit here. So one of the things important about the autocratic part is that we talk about the security part of the Trinity acts like a buffer between the rule, ruler and the ruled. Um, th that's how they keep the people from rising up. And usually in order for the people to uh, for the destabilization to occur, uh, the military apparatus either has to work or be defeated by the people themselves uh, to take over for that ruler. Uh, pretty much any autocracy, you know, they can only rule for so long because people are going to become smart and learn uh, how to pivot and adjust. Even in cybersecurity, you know, you, your threat actor learns to pivot and adjust, and so do you. And so that's what causes uh, the, the point of transformation itself. So uh, in this case, um, you go from one person being in charge or one family being in charge to representation uh, occurring. And so they give that special trust to leaders within uh, each group uh, or you know whatever entity you're trying to uh, put that leadership uh, in for that point of transformation. Um, and then usually it turns into a republic. When it becomes a republic, uh, you know, I had a great uh, part whenever I used to teach. I'd ask uh, a lot of lieutenants. I go, you know, what kind of what kind of uh, government do you have? And they say a democracy. I said, okay, go ahead and say the pledge of allegiance, and I'll give you time to think about it for a second. Right. So we're in a republic. Yes, a representative democracy, a republic, demo you know, what have you. Parts of it are democratic. Most of it's republic. Uh, in this, we have a represent a representative government. Uh, this is what Machiavelli thought was the most uh, important and functional uh, way to govern. 
uh, balance powers balanced out amongst the Trinity. And Clausewitz thought the same thing. This is the most. This is the why the Trinity exists the way it is because they thought it was the most functional and, and uh, best represented in, in and everything. Uh, but sometimes there's destabilization that occurs. Uh, one part, like I said, of that Trinity destabilizes and causes uh, things to fall apart. Uh, and people maybe feel like they're not being represented the way they are uh, supposed to be. Maybe uh, there's some kind of uh, change in hegemony uh, that that maybe some sh kind of shadow entity tries to come in and, and, and try to influence them. Uh, I know that occurred. Uh, one of the rare things that I wrote up had occurred when uh, uh, radical Islam happened. Uh, there was a lot of things that were trying to be changed as far as the hegemony, uh, starting off in the 1960s by the guy that was the father of radical Islam. Uh, he went to college actually in Colorado. Uh, if I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but if, if anybody really wants to know, I'll, I'll answer that uh, with feedback. But he went to college in Colorado and he hated American men for being very muscular and, and, and overbearing. Uh, he thought women were scantily clad, but also showed that he was severely attract, significantly attracted to American women. Uh, but he also, that's what drove him to create the modern day, uh, modern day radical Islam from our, you know, time in the last 20 years, uh, where that we really saw a lot of that. That's what drove it is because of his exposure to the United States. And that's why he created it. So, uh, he, you know, they had a lot of shadow entities that were trying to drive and change the hegemony of the United States. And that was all because of that. And so, uh, that'll weaken your society itself. China does it a lot now. Why do you think fentanyl is com coming into the United States? It's because there's a thing, a book called Unrestricted Warfare, uh, and I suggest reading that. And in it, you'll see what they call fourth generational warfare. Uh, that's military operations other than combat. And when this one is called, uh, when it's regarding the drug trade in, in China driving uh, fentanyl through the Central American, South American countries, that's because they're trying to destabilize uh, society through uh, the drug use. Um, it's called social degradation. Um, that's that's what the the part of fourth generational warfare that they're trying to do. So you see that happening. Um, the point of transformation is you lose public trust and you form in more of a smaller groups. And that's when democracy happens. You feel like, okay, well, the, we can't trust the government. We can't trust the security. So we're going to let the people lead. And yet when it's not really all, all people were leading, uh, each group, each uh, people break up into different groups and they're led by, you know, uh, certain people that may feel like they're, say that they're part of the group, but they kind of lead into it. Uh, um, they act like they're part of the group, but they're, actually what they call like more of the intellectual tier itself. And they kind of, you know, nudge people, but there's a lot of division that occurs within democracy itself. I wish it was the other way around, but it, it's in, in these representations, democracy is important. It works on a lower level, but when you get a mass group of folks, then you start breaking off into different groups and things become easily disabled. Um, so, uh, You'll find a lot of countries that have that to bring together all the groups. They're more autocratic, but they act like they're representative, uh, representational government uh, for the people. They say, we're the people's republic of blah, blah, blah. But they're more trying to gather everybody together in one group and act like your democracy. But they're very forceful in hand. Uh, think of North Korea. They claim that everybody's you know together and all that stuff. And it's democracy, but it is absolutely not. It's just, it's easier to control people if they're in one group. When they become destabilized in that sense, uh, it's hard to control the different groups because they can, you know, one part can break off and, and change, uh, use the Trinity against that uh, government itself. So there's different clashes between groups uh, when it points to transformation and people become more free of thought and everything, but all these different groups are fighting each other and then anarchy typically occurs out of democracy. And that's when you think of uh, uh, conflict. This is where contention happens. So this is uh, where I end my part on uh, evolution of governance and we're gonna take a break. I know everybody's probably ready, ready for it. And we'll get into the last portion here uh, in a bit. 
uh, after us do a 10 minute break because uh, I, I got a little bit to cover, but I'll move a little bit quicker. You see here. But yeah, that's the evolution of governance. And you can apply this framework whenever trying to understand things that are geopolitical. If you got to do an Intel uh, team and you got to understand that, that's what you're going to do. Let me end this slideshow here and we'll call it 10 minutes from now. We're going to knock this out. I'm excited. Uh, I'm glad you guys showed up and let's stay awake. Uh, run in place if you have to or drink water. Okay, situational awareness. This is going into the next section uh, where we get into collection. <clears throat> you have to understand who you are in relationship to your uh, the threat actor. Um, I want to say that I, I, I teach situational awareness too when it comes to real life as opposed to computer virtual life. Um, here, I want to take something I've applied for that, and I've also kind of stolen from the guy who created the diamond model. But uh, you got to understand who you are and why you're a target. Um, I, 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 you know, tried to teach. Uh, I've tried to teach some people uh, more specifically. I've I've taught some women how to how to be prepared for danger when they go out. I used to be a bouncer. Um, and I saw all the bad things, the bad guys doing bad things uh, against people that they deem vulnerable. Um, and I've taught a lot of uh, uh, women how to, you know, look out for dangers and stuff like that when they're out and about, how to stay in groups and things like that. But also, you know, I grew up around St. Louis and St. Louis is a very dangerous place. Um, and, and trying to navigate that is, can, it can be difficult. So you gotta understand your relationship and what, uh, to the threat actor and what makes you a victim. Uh, potential victim in their eyes. Um, I'm not saying you are a victim, but what they deem you as a victim and why. Uh, two, are you a target of opportunity? Is it because you may have a you know a nice car and have some money? Maybe it's your persona itself. Maybe you walked into the wrong place. Uh, you know, I, I had friends when I was out in Fort Huachuca who were wearing just came back from golfing and had khakis and sandals and polo shirts and they wanted to go into a biker bar. And I was like, you know, uh, bad idea. Let me go in and see what it looks like. You know, and I said, no, you, you shouldn't go in there. <laughs> you know, maybe it's the property you possess. Maybe you got a house, maybe you got a car. We talked about relay attacks for cars. Maybe it's the, you know, the, you know, the car you're driving, somebody wants to take, uh, they, you know, decide that, you know, they don't, you don't need that. Uh, understanding that relationship is part of your collection process, right? One of the ways that they did this is the diamond model. Uh, this diamond model is uh, applicable in real life, and it could be uh, definitely it's made for cybersecurity uh, purposes. But this is how we process information in the easiest and simple way. Um, here, you're trying to determine risk uh, and threat collectively, and it can be done through a process that's uh, not very reactive, like most organizations do in determining threat. If you were in a fist fight, success is not measured by how well you put your hands up over your head and how quickly the cops came to chase the guy off. Uh, <clears throat> proactive intelligence measures uh, proactive intelligence measures by not putting yourself in a position of compromise by looking at yourself and realizing you need to do some, you know, let's say Krav Maga or something or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and do some push ups, you know. Uh, in other words, determining the threat landscape, the threat actor's intent, identifying your weaknesses against the threat actor, identifying your strengths and assessing risk. Uh, in order for there to be a fight, you need, to, you need someone to get. Uh, you need somebody to get like kicked in the chest and a chest to be kicked. If the attacker has the intent and has the foot and there is someone in the proximity that also has a chest, uh, then you just uh, made yourself a structure to your threat. Uh, you just made the structure for your threat assessment. Some organizations use a diamond model for threat assessment and doing proactive. Uh, they do intrusion analysis, which is reactive. It's a good cognitive tool because it is only a forward tool. Uh, once you get past seven parts of a cognitive tool, like a framework, you start to defeat the purpose of the tool. Because according to a book, and if you get a chance to read it, Psychology of Intelligence Analysis uh, by Hewer, uh, it's a good book to read. He talks about, you know, humans can only really identify seven bits of information and remember it. Here, this is a tool that has about uh, four parts, just like the intelligence cycle. So let's take the diamond model, account, diamond model and kind of apply it to, you know, similar to a game of Clue. You have the killer, you have the weapon, the room, and the host, right? 
this is exactly uh, the same kind of methodology or uh, framework you're using for the diamond model itself, adversary capability and infrastructure and victim. So let's break down those two parts and then know where to put our intelligence information and data into. So you kind of take of uh, a, 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 it in even uh, simpler terms is the adversaries of who, the capability what, infrastructure is where, and victim is why. And you fill that in data into the information uh, uh, into those little silos. Uh, and I don't mean that in a negative context, right? So understanding your situation. When you're creating intelligence, uh, if you have mass amounts of data coming in and no method for its flow, then you'll never determine the effects. The creation of a priority intelligence requirement or intelligence directive, uh, it tells you what, what way your organization will be affected the most and in, in what way. Uh, when determining threats to your organization's network, you have to identify the five W's, you know, who, what, when, where, and why. Uh, that's part of the why being, you know, kind of that dissemination of information, you know, your analysis part. Uh, with attempting to, to make that determination on how threats attack your organization, there needs to be a process for determining that risk, uh, such as threats. So now we're going to discuss frameworks. I cannot stand how many different tools in the private sector there is to do things. Um, it drives me crazy because decentralization in this sense creates chaos. I teach chaos theory, not in a mathematical sense, but in the intelligence analysis sense. And if anybody would like to learn more about that, please email me and I'll, I'll, I'll discuss it with you and I'll show you where I can, I, can, I can talk about it. I wrote a little bit about it in Small Wars Journal, but I can talk more about it. Think of it like this. Why has Chicago got a bunch of gang, gang problems? It's because they had these larger gangs living in these high-rise buildings and they controlled from the floor up to the, to the roof that area right <clears throat> once they tore those towers down gangs became the surface area you think about the diamond model the area that you exist the infrastructure became flat it wasn't one building that went straight up and it was collective they had to own property out on a flat area the streets. And so the gangs became decentralized and cut off their own little blocks. When it became more decentralized, it became more violent and crim criminality occurred more. Same thing happened after post-World War, post -World War I. Middle East, post-World War II, got divided up. British mandated this, French mandated that. You know, all of Middle, Middle, Middle East was harder to control because it was so decentralized. Uh, look into uh, a manual written by uh, a guy. It's called The Management of Savagery, and they discuss everything about decentralization and deterministic chaos theory uh, in the bad sense. It's more poetic than anything else, uh, kind of like a, a guy writing, uh, Jack Kerouac writing On the Road. It's It discusses how decentralizing middle the Middle East uh, created a lot of the problems in that Duran line or what have you. Uh, they were going to try to regain that so they can gain power. So if they re-stabilized or re-centralized the Middle East, the ISIS, ISIS would be able to have uh, more power. That's the same thing here. It's so decentralized with all these different tools and all these different vendors per, per discipline that it's became a significant problem. So what do we, how do we defeat that? Frameworks. This is why you take all that data, all that information, and you put it in the frameworks and make sense of it, right? So intelligence failures. <clears throat> I don't care how well informed your 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 leaders are. Uh, if they're occurring, if your intelligence fails occur, um, when when you have a lack of capabilities, uh, it, it's I can't I can't push this enough. Um, if you if you're not getting buyback from your leadership, it's you're gonna fail, right? So you do that if you give them a whole mess of information rather than a very thought out uh, uh, product, and you're not you're providing it in a relevant in in uh, readable fashion. 
then you'll have more trust from your leadership. And if you don't get that, if you're decentralized, if you're messy and you're not making sense and your data is just data thrown at, thrown at your leadership or whoever your stakeholder client is, you're going to fail no matter what, because you won't get buyback. So too much information uh, it exists in the intelligence community. I hate it. I fight against it all the time, but that's also why I got, uh, I, I probably didn't, I got a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, haters whenever I was coming up in the Intel uh, community. So there's not enough relevant information. Everybody, there's people in the intelligence community uh, and, and everything who wants to um, be the owner or the shining light. You can't be a rock star in the Intel community. Uh, you just gotta do, be matter of fact. And that's why I say the truth is unimpeachable. And that's what I'm talking about here. You need to be irrelevant. You need to speak the truth of what's going on and not try to be a superstar. Otherwise you're gonna fail your organization, whoever your, your clients are. So let's talk about, uh, I won't cover too much in this again, um, but I will say this, uh, levels of information, intelligence information, strategic, operational, tactical, think of it as the ends, ways, and means. Um, here, uh, like I said, I won't, I won't hit too much on it. I already kind of covered that. So let's talk about how we frame our problem set. Uh, frameworks are set, uh, set the intelligence information in a logical way. Uh, without structure and knowledge of the life cycle of a threat, you have a poor assessment. So maybe your problem set is, you know, you got a leaking or is a, your leaking, uh, organization's uh, leaked information. You got, uh, you know, bad uh, vulnerability within your servers and so on. So you have different problem sets that you got to identify how to figure out the problem set. And you do that through that, through that framework itself. Um, so one of the ways that I thought about it, uh, I'm, I'm going to add two different frameworks that are already existing. I'm going to show you where their strengths and weaknesses are. So first off, take your shot, MITRE TAC framework, yes. Okay, they are very good at the operational and tactical level. Okay, it's very, it can show technical direction of threat actors. Uh, it, it shows you the tactics and techniques, not so much the procedures where I talked about policy, it's tactics and techniques. Uh, tactical intelligence itself is specifically almost about the, the action that occurred. So that's how you determine that. Yeah, that's, that's what you're determining when you talk about tactical intelligence is how those things occurred. I'm sorry for moving quickly, but I want to make sure that I meet the time frame here so I can have time for questions and everything. Um, so Minor Tech Framework is a knowledge base uh, that came out several, you know, several years ago. They've refined it several times, and I really do appreciate it, uh, um, them, do, they, them doing that. But it's very granular. It helps out security teams, incident response, everything all the ISO teams that I talked about. Um, it's definitely used to be a very matter of fact of what happened and definitely prioritizing uh, the, your, your reactions and stuff to it, right? So we covered that it's, I covered that it's operational tactical level, but what about strategic level? Uh, there's a thing called the ODNI cyber th threat framework. And if you've been familiar with it, if you've used it before, if you hate it, that's fine. Um, I'm just using it as an example of why and how you can create uh, your own frameworks or why frameworks are written the way that they are. Because uh, if you understand it, you can be a content creator and you know produce intelligence a lot more effectively. What they try to do here is they try to understand the nature of cyber threats because ODNI was what? You had Air Force, Navy, we were all service, you know, most all service members here, I think. And you guys have different terms and manuals and everything uh, pre 9 11. Uh, you, you know, different, uh, the different branches uh, try to keep information close to chest because they want to be like positivity bias. Hey, look what I have. I'm producing this, I'm giving it to you. Isn't this great? The Navy, hey, we need more funding. Here's some great intelligence that I produced. Here's a great, you know, thing that, that occurred by the Navy. Aren't we cool? Give us more funding so we can keep driving this way. That developed a lot of problems. My personal thing was, uh, if you get a chance to go on TED Talks and listen to General McChrystal talk about keeping information close to chest, it's just like a five minute speech. <clears throat> and it was a, a fantastic speech to talking about the problems of while I was in Panjway, um, doing some you know taking care of some bad guys and doing some good stuff but we also had special forces guys that lived in the same area and we weren't talking to each other we weren't sharing information 
and we would snatch up dudes that they were late they were waiting on or they knew information about dudes we wanted to send that we didn't know who they were but they knew the names and they had that information we weren't sharing and i tried to fix that problem we did and we got well way more effective once we started information sharing uh for guys that lived like just down the road right or on the same base sometimes information sharing is important Odie and i tried to solve that problem uh so that's why they were trying to speak the same language so as could reach out everybody across the board. In cybersecurity, uh, you have a lot of different processes and frameworks uh, from NSA to STIX uh, to Lockheed Martin's Kill Chain. I mean, just, just everything. But where do you get into that problem is look how many different portions of a life cycle that you have. I mean, for NSA, Jesus, they have 14 different parts of the life cycle. Can you walk out and know into the hallway from a briefing and walk on the hallway and discuss every portion, every section or tactic or technique? You gotta be able to develop as disseminate information in a way that your stakeholders can go in the hallway or the water cooler and say, yeah, man, this is what happened. And this is what we need to move on it right now. Or are you gonna have to wait for a product to be shipped out to you, right? So that's why the cyber threat framework was really helpful because they had that four, four areas based off of research paradigm. So the research paradigm is based, uh, uh, understands the natural processes of things. And in this, you have the first stage and this MITRE tech framework kind of does the same thing, right? Um, first you have, and I'm not gonna try to uh, pronounce these things cause I'm trying to speed through here, but you got the study of being what we know exists. Water's wet, sky's blue, you know, beer's good, right? Uh, then you have, those are what we consider the stages, those four stages. Study of knowledge. These are the things that you you gain through your wisdom and everything, that you things that you know that they exist. Objectives are meant to be met, right? You don't know the actions. When I talk about being an NCO, you understand what, you know, you need to be technically proficient before you're tactically proficient. That's what I'm talking about here. You have to understand how to be technically proficient objectives before you can become tactically proficient. Because if you don't know shit about what you're doing and you're just going to play it by ear, you're, you know, you don't know, understand the technique, you're not going to be able to do the, the action. You're not going to be able to do the, the, the tactic. Okay. You can play by ear. You can try hit and miss. You know, I used to do Brazilian, I did Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and they say, you know, if you lose, you learn, right? It's the same thing here, but we're going to try to be effective as military because we only, you know, it's life or limb or eyesight, and we got to understand the technical part of it before we understand how to do it tactically, and that's what it's here. We understand the methodology, the axiology. Uh, that's where you discover, you know, you discover which which knowledge exists and being applied. So <clears throat> this is where it kind of breaks down. I won't hit too far on it, but this is where that framework follows. Uh, follows it. It talks about the stages and progression of uh, the actions on the objective, uh, the objectives themselves. Why are they conducting it? This is where you understand why they're conducting a certain action or a series of actions. Okay, the actions that occur is associated with the methodology. It's it, you know it's understanding the value of that methodology itself. You know how is it being done? Not not how do you you know how do you or what is being done necessarily. Uh, or how you would do it, but it's like, well, we, you know, how it's occurring uh, and being applied. I should should say that's how the objective is being applied itself. And that's the investigative part. Methodology, uh, it gets into more, uh, the methods that's being applied gets more into the indicators. Uh, and that's where you get more into that very refined uh, intelligence data. So how does that, how's that thrown in here? Uh, you can break it down into this in a very simple way. Uh, let's say you're talking about the engagement portion and you in the in CTI, I'm sorry, the CTF, the cyber threat framework from ODI. It says the engagement stage, you are interacting, the objective is to interact interact with the intended victim, right? Or you deliver the malicious, uh, the malicious uh, weaponized uh, item. From there, you figure out the action. It says, okay, well, how did they interact with the intended victim? They persuaded them to act on the threat actor's behalf. You talk about in, insider threat framework uh, here in a minute. That's where that occurs. 
is you persuade somebody else to do what you want them to do. I call, uh, we talk about ransomware. I say there's four evolutions. There's four evolutions, meaning one, they encrypt it. Two, they encrypt it. And, and uh, if you're not going to pay, they're going to sell your data. Uh, they threaten to release your data online and sell your data. Third is they, you know, encrypt your stuff. If you threaten to uh, post it online uh, and also steal your information, maybe something from your emails that you got. And now they're going to pivot to the next person that's related to a peer organization involved with you. Fourth being that they're trying to take advantage of like maybe the pandemic and a lot of layoffs that may be occurring here soon. Uh, and definitely during the pandemic and a lot of people got curtailed. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. A lot of people uh, uh, lost their jobs overall and they, you know, they see that coming and they're not feeling happy about what's going on economically or what have you, or within their organization. And now they're trying to hire you uh, do ransomware uh, evolution, the fourth evolution by trying to get an insider threat to trigger it uh, instead of doing initial access and going through a lot of recon and all that work. So these are the things that you try to understand that, uh, through, through a stage objective action and indicator. So why is it, why is it hard with MITRE? Uh, because it's tactics and techniques. That's the MITRE tech framework probably from a, you know, a couple of years ago. I'm sure there's been some changes, but look how much information is there. You have to go through there and figure out what's relatable and put it in a silo. So it's difficult to articulate, but very good if you get a machine to do it, or if you're technically, you have a, you know, you know, your technical uh, 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 employee or team member who can do that. And it's very important for business business implications and, and, uh, stating what's going on, uh, but you can break it down into what's going on into your strategic understanding here. Uh, this is the cyber threat framework, and I looked at an incident that was occurring, and this is kind of what it meant, right? So I lay out the stage of when something occurred and its objectives and actions. If you did that in a minor tech framework, this is kind of what it would look like. This is kind of like a heat map uh, where this stuff occurred. And you can count how many times something uh, something happened. A lot of file and uh, directory discovery incidents happening over the month. And what you'd like to do is you take all that information, right? So let me walk back walk back a little bit here. Remember where I talked about you work with your SOC you and the hunt team and the incident response, and you work with the cyber threat intelligence team, and then you guys do your fusion group and you do what I call a CTAR, cyber threat analytical report, which takes all those reports, all that information, and you go through the intelligence cycle and you fill out a heat map, a MITRE tech heat, uh, MITRE tech heat map. And once you're done with that re report, once you've filled out the heat map, go, go talk to your red team. Go talk to your threat and vulnerability management teams. Bring them your report. Show them that heat map. And now that, per now that red team can go in and do some purple teaming with the SOC and say, hey, we tested against this. We suck. <laughs> Let's fix it. They fix it. And they say, sock, okay, now that we fixed it, let's see how you do against that kind of attack. Maybe it's something that can't be blocked or alerted. Maybe it's just the, the methodology you got to look at. And you do your purple teaming, blue teaming, whatever. And you say, okay, well, let's look at it. How are we doing? And then you give evaluation on it and say, hey, we do really good against this. We're secure. We're not concerned about that. If they pivot and they do another kind of attack, then that'll work. Then we'll, we'll, we'll focus on that. But it's a good cycle. You see how it goes. You get your indicator, something happened, something popped. You do your hunt, you do your investigative work. Your investigative work is done and now you wanna look at the, not just the local maximum, but the global maximum. And you get your CTI team involved. Your CTI team involves with all the previous uh, portions. You figure out what, what occurred, what wanted to occur, what could have occurred and all of its parallels. You do your heat map and you do your advisement and you produce a product. And that drives the operation for red team to sit here and do your heat map and, and say, hey, here's, here's what we're gonna start doing testing against. And then they test against it and they say, okay, now here's your intelligence directives and your refinement and feedback from leadership. Here's what I want you to test now against those parallels, those pivots that could occur and let's secure it. And then SOC goes through it and they don't have those indicators anymore, but, but they find new ones. And now that you know that you're more secure now and then you become more secure uh, as you work through that process all over again. If there's anything I can teach you here, uh, you kind of accumulating everything together, that's what I want you to want you to hear. 
is that this is a cycle and a process that you need to involve your C if it's CTI. This is what a good intelligence program does is that you're refining everything. You're working with the other teams, okay? And so uh, I'm not gonna cover intelligence documentation and drafting, but I will say this real quick. Um, when you write, I want you to write if, if we're all you know veterans here, I'm sure you've run a, wrote a sit temp or a counseling or uh, an, an award of something, uh, kind of like doing an elevator speech, okay? You do not wanna do passive language whenever you write. You wanna, uh, uh, you wanna to be direct, right? Um, you, if I remember, I'm trying to remember it right off the top of my head, but it's like, you know, did the cat chase the mouse or the mouse uh, was running away from the cat, right? The thing that that is doing something to something else, and what was the action the act, the the action that happened afterwards? That's kind of the way that you want to write things. I'll give you a great example. If you ever been in an operations center and you're pulling in uh, a, a a sig act, a significant activity, as I used to call it, or as as they call it, I don't know what they do it amongst the different branches, but you call it a sig act. Uh, so an event, an incident occurs. How are you writing in that in the log? Are you putting a time date stamp on there, right? If you're doing a time time uh, date time group, who it happened to? See how we're getting a diamond model here. Who did it happen to? Who did it? What action occurred uh, during that 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 event? What was the battle damage? The BT uh, uh, BDA, the battle damage assessment, uh, and what is our reaction? What's what? When are we going to go to the AAR about it? afterwards and figure out what happened, uh, what needs to change as a result of that. I remember specifically writing up reports as I did in the Excel uh, log, where I do date time group, who, who did it, what happened, BDA, and what was the result, right? I would write my reports like that. And whenever I wrote it in whether summary paragraph form, date time group, what did you, you know, who, what, when, everything that I just stated in that structure, especially delivering that abstract or summary or so what, or, or bluff, bottom line up front. If you put that in there in the same way, I want you to think of it like this. This is you creating and disseminating a product for your customer. And if they get used to seeing certain bits of information in certain places, It'll be easy muscle memory. And it'll be easier for them to retain. This is where I get in that critical thinking kind of thing and how people think and how they retain information. That's why I'm so hell bent on talking about frameworks and stru structure when developing intelligence. If you go into Facebook and you ever seen those things that say uh, where the first and last letters are the same or the word counts the same and the spacing and the word placement is the same, but the letters are all jumbled up. And it says, if you can read this, if you can read it, if you read this, then you are a very smart person because that means that you can understand how do people, you know, read and understand things. Do that same thing with your intelligence product. They know where they're going to read the bluff, the bottom line up front, or the summary, or the abstract. They know where they're going to get the assessment. They know where they're going to see the, the behavioral tree. They know where they're going to get the uh, technical data from the reverse engineer, right? They know where they're going to get the so what the assessment, there are references. Structure your data the same every single way, every single, uh, the same way every single time. It becomes muscle memory, it becomes easier to retain, and all that bit of information is structured in a way that's uh, in, in the proper way. When I talked about uh, that manual that was written, the management of savagery, and it was written like Jack Kerouac on the road, and if you're not familiar, basically what it was, somebody got hopped up on drugs, wrote stuck all these pages together and started typing away for you know a day or two and wrote a whole book and jay Kerouac did i don't know if he was on drugs but it, maybe i'm safe to assume um but it was a very artsy flowery kind of book uh you know poetic right it sounded like their thoughts that's not american literature that's eastern style literature and that's how they the 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 Groups like Taliban and Al Qaeda and all those uh, ideological groups write. They write it like artsy flowery. It's all over the place. When we structure data, we stru write write things. We write it in a structured manner, and so it's retainable. 
And that's the way that you need to write and disseminate your products. I'll hit on this uh, last bit here, insider threat intelligence framework. I was gonna give you an exercise. You can, uh, if you give my slides or you wanna take a picture of this or, or what have you, uh, this is a good insider threat uh, framework for you to do one investigations, but also structure your data in a way that if you're investigating an insider threat, structure it in this way. Uh, so you're not writing things all over the place. Maybe you're using Splunk and you're doing your investigation and you write it up one way, but what may occur is like information that you're trying to understand and the next analyst does it in a different way, then you're going to have no trend data at all. You're, it's going to be all over the place. The example I like to use is we had at CAF, Kandahar Airfield, uh, they had the strategic uh, level reporters and we were a bunch of officers who put it into this one system and they would get information from all the different entities, the different patrol bases and intel analysts that are out there on the ground. And so when I try to do uh, IED information or ID, ID, IED collection and plot all the IEDs, whether exploded, unexploded and fake, it was all over the place and it was missing a lot of data. And I was like looking at it and I go, a lot of this information is, and I'm telling you this because it's not relevant anymore, right? Uh, a lot of this information, there was IEDs all over the place. There's significant activities on bases. And I said, why are IEDs all over the place on bases? Because when they structured their, they wrote, a lot of Intel analysts wrote, they wrote it like a news reporter and not structured as opposed to um, structuring it the way that I'm saying it in a, in a framework uh and everything and so the date the the plot points were all over the place and they were putting the plot points in this reporting of where it was reported as opposed to where the SIGAC occurred and so I spent three months going through every IED report that I could and I plotted I won't I won't say the count but I just all pretty much all of RC South and every ID from exploded to unexploded and every in fake and everything else and structured in a way and put them back in there. And I gave it to the uh, 80 seconds uh, map team and, and, and everything. I said, here's all your ID information fixed. And it was a re really, you know, really happy about that. And I'm sure a lot of other guys on the ground really appreciated that too, because they knew where this occurred uh, rather than getting IEDs that were on bases rather than out on the roads like Ra Hyena or, you know, highway one. Um, so that information was very important, um, be, it, but you got to structure your data for that very same reason. So you can identify trends and you can build that muscle memory in your clients, uh, your stakeholders, and they can retain that information. This is a good framework to use, use it, pass it along. I don't care. You can see the same things that I said before. It, you got your ends, ways, and means that goes back into the operational design. It's the stuff has relationships to each other. Um, one of the ways that you could do this, and I'll cut through this real quick, uh, employees determined by the status and the role that they have. Uh, asset is whatever device network and uh, the, or any device network, what do you have? What, you know, what machine are you being assigned? What kind of digital indicators you're seeing? Maybe something that's uh, suspicious activity. Maybe they're logging in in the middle of the night or on the weekends. Uh, what's the vulnerability? That's self-explanatory. What's the weakness in your system? What's the catalyst and change in the environment? Layoffs are occurring, right? Maybe maybe that's the catalyst. Is it somebody, uh, maybe they created a product that they weren't getting, you know, maybe they're getting passive for promotion, okay? But that's the catalyst. That's the change in the environment that occurs. What's the motivation? Well, it's how does that actor perceive that catalyst? How are they reacting to it, right? Behavioral indicators. What are what are you seeing from uh, from that person? Maybe they're leaving early. Maybe they're logging in or late. Uh, maybe there's no. They're you know they're not doing any work and they're they're not caring about it. Do you guys anybody worked uh, in counterintelligence or anything like that? You've seen this, right? You're familiar with some some of this stuff. You know what's the intent? Self-explanatory. What's the skills that they have? Are they an engineer or architect? That's very important to know. Do they have the ability to code? Do they have the, you know, I've, I've had um, a lot of very smart folks that work in, work, uh, in cybersecurity and they can be, go from being a friend uh, to a frenemy very quick. Uh, but 
their skill sets are very can determine whether they can walk away or they have to stay. And if they have to walk away and they have bad intentions, their skill sets very important. Access. Oh my gosh, how many times did I had turned down a first sergeant, uh, you know, command sergeant major? Or, uh, you know, officer saying, you don't need a top secret clearance. I'm sorry. I'm that guy. You don't need it. Uh, and, and and that's in cybersecurity. That's can be so detrimental. Is you, who, who's providing access? Did you shut off their access when they were getting ready to be laid off? That's so important. Uh, uh, if you if you get into this, in this field or you already are and you're not understanding access and how long that person has access compared to the, you know, this structure here, you, you got to understand, you got to know it. What's the capability that they possess um, in, in, within that organization? You know, what's, what is, how, do they, how, how can their capability or ability affect your organization? Methodology, this is a combination of everything else uh, from vulnerability and intent capability. And all that marries down to what the threat is. If you possess all that knowledge, we're talking about collecting, you link it, analyze it together, those other sections, you can possess, possess that. I'm gonna go ahead and say that I'm done. I'm gonna open up for questions. Uh, this is my email that I want you to send any requests for the slides. Uh, go ahead and, and, you know, it's tier intelligence, like the uh, Norse God tier. Uh, he was, the, I guess, the god of justice. Uh, he got his hand bit off by Fenir, uh, Fenir, Fenerus, I think that's what it's called. Um, but tierintelligence at gmail.com. Uh, I, I, I welcome anybody to hit me up on LinkedIn with questions too, if you didn't get this uh, email and you want to uh, you know, be part of my network, I, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, let's hit up some questions and I will, I will end that. And I will end sharing. Okay. Yeah, thank you for putting that in there, Jonathan. I appreciate it. I wish that I could sit here and turn on the uh, the mics for anybody who had a question. I, I don't. I'm sorry that didn't. I didn't get a, uh, control of that here, but tap out your questions if you got any questions. All right, we got a couple. Do I feel like auditing is being utilized? Uh, Utilizing, uh, utilize these effectively. Do I, do I feel like auditing is being utilized effectively? I think that it's, you know, you can, you can create a lot of chaos by requ requiring a lot of things, right? Um, Auditing is important. I mean, you get like, you know, trust, but verify, right? That's, that's very important. Um, I haven't been through a lot of audits. There's been some, you know, I, I've done hell. I mean, we're, you know, all service members. And so I've had to do inspections on, on uh, armories and everything. Uh, it could be a pain in the ass, but also trying to make sure that everybody's prepared. I mean, if you, well, you've heard it before, if you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail, right? Um, so I think auditing is important, but I don't think that they really use, uh, they don't involve intelligence as effectively as they should. I think they're very granular and there's good purpose for it. You got to check the box, but I don't think that they, they involve intelligence guys, uh, effectively enough. I'm not familiar necessarily with the latest Microsoft breach, uh, Tyler. I wish that I had any more. Um, ah, yeah, five Ps, yeah, nice, nice, yeah. Okay, what CTI platform would you recommend for someone that is just standing up a, co a company CTI program? 
I, I, I utilized Maltigo. Uh, uh, Maltigo XL, I think it was. Uh, that's just a leak analysis tool. And I know that some guys have used something similar to DSIGs. Uh, a, I think is an analyst notebook uh, on there. It's, it's more of a link analysis tool. I loved using that. Um, not D6 itself. I was a D6 cadre uh, when I was with First Army. Didn't like doing that. Um, I thought it was kind of a shitty system, but the idea behind D6 is what created your cloud infrastructure uh, within, within cybersecurity uh, uh, nowadays. So a lot of the cloud platforms that you use now is because of D6A and their information sharing uh, capabilities. But they had a thing on their analyst notebook and that was a great tool for me. Yeah, here you go, Richard. Yeah, it, it, it was a great it was a great tool uh, to, to use. Uh, I hate configuring them, but it, it was great. Uh, but Maltigo kind of does the same thing. And so you have all those, you have free, what they call, I guess, entities, um, I can't remember the terminology maybe, but you can have something like virus total or anything, just like uh, some of uh, transforms. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, you can have a lot of transforms that ingest. Uh, I like MISP. MISP is not a tip. If anybody says that, I think you're wrong. You you know, I'm all love to you. I, I don't think MISP is, a, is a, a threat intelligence platform. It's a threat intelligence repository. So we talk about data, intelligence information, and intelligence. It collects data. It really does. You can put all the tags you want on there. But as you can see, I there's so many false positives that get thrown into that thing, and that can distract from it. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Tyler, I agree. Yeah. Uh, uh, not yeah, not enough sec DevOps being utilized in their process. Um, so I think MISP is good to have because you're putting all that information in one thing and you're collecting a lot of IOCs. That's a good tool for data uh, and, and you know intelligence information. But uh, I think link analysis tool that's involved in Maltigo is good. Uh, it depends if you want to keep their server your server in house if you want to utilize their servers. Um, gosh, if I needed to collect information on when an IOC was utilized, I like, uh, I like using alien, I think it's alien vaults, open thread exchange, OTX. Um, yep. Love doing that. Uh, let me see what else, uh, virus total. Like I said, I like to get in there feedly. Yeah. Um, I think there's a new thing I'm going to check out here, and I think it's called OpenCTI. Um, I'm going to look at that and see if I like that. Um, that's a good one. Um, what else? Dude, uh, Twitter. Uh, you, you get into fight clubs for guys like Gossy the Dog. I forgot his real name. Um, let's see. I, I mean, just find the different fight clubs. Uh, it, it, it does, that's a that's a great source. Um, what were you saying, Tyler? Microsoft confirmed server misconfiguration led to six. Wow, when did that happen? Maybe I'm not keeping up on things right now. Yeah, I, I have to read more upon it. More questions here. Brad, I want you to expand a little bit here on what you're trying to say. Yeah, back in October, I have to, I have to check it out. I maybe I'm just not keeping up on it because I've been managing a lot more often, uh, and I've been keeping. Uh, we're working on um, a lot more geopolitical stuff that's been going on, uh, so I I haven't been focused on the Microsoft thing. 
Um, so I haven't been analyzing. I've been kind of developing uh, stuff a lot more often. So my apologies. Yeah, you know, I, I completely agree. It does have geopolitical, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, but mine has been more toward, it's just not been my focus, but uh, it's definitely been part of my teams. Um, but I'll, I'll have to read more into that. Yeah, so... I haven't got a chance to work with Hacker One. Um, I think Bishop Fox is a good source uh, of, of inf information. I like them. Uh, uh, it's been a while since I've had to deal with Hacker One, uh, and, and when I did, I, I didn't have to engage with them too much. Um, but Yeah, I, you know, I love using, I like keeping it, you know, easy and functional. So I utilize a lot of, of, uh, um, I did my own research. Like I said, I, I remember one specific and I'll, I'll, I'll out them a little bit here. When I worked for enterprise, uh, we had a, we had a, uh, we had a domain, uh, domain name takeover thing where this, a uh, threat actor got a domain that looked uh, had to last, you know. Uh, it, it had our, uh, you know, the organization's, um, yeah, typo squatting. Thank you. Uh, so it had that in there, the name of the the company, and I was like, hey, why didn't you guys tell us about that? And they said, oh, the naming convention was was so you know broad and all that stuff. I go. It's the name of the company. So if somebody got a domain with the name of the company on it, why didn't you as a vendor tell us, right? And they said, well, no, it's just too broad and all that stuff. Hey, the vendors are not gonna have your best interest necessarily. Uh, I don't I don't feel like they're, don't just rely on them. I'm not saying they don't have a, a buy-in and, and, and concern for you as, a, as, a, as, a, as an organization, but, if you relied on them solely, you're going to miss out on so much. So I do a lot of threat and, and, and you know, I'm, I'm big on OSINT. So I like to look for my information as best as possible. Do I hit up those other sources? Yes. Do I pay for it? Do we have vendors? Yes. Do we utilize them? Absolutely. But do I solely remi re rely on them? No. Yep. Absolutely, Tyler. Yep. You have to be intentional. Uh, it's, you talk to guys probably like Black Hills and some of those other guys who are, you know, really nerdy, uh, in a good way, um, about what they do. And they're like, Hey, you know, we're, we're the SMEs, the subject matter experts, and we're putting out great information, uh, and, and everything, but they're the real nerds about it. Um, they'll tell you, you gotta be responsible for your own stuff. If you rely and keep it like a business model, you know, like, hey, we're, we pay them for this. And so we expect this result, you're going to fail. You will. It's just the way it is. You got That's why I'm telling you as veterans, you have that added ability to, with experience and being able to, you know, apply it. Uh, so if you can do that, um, you can take that skill set that you have and apply it effectively then you're going to be that, that added benefit to your uh, organization because you can think critically and, and, and everything. So, yeah, exactly, Kyle. Another thing too is I, I yeah, old sayings. I had, a, I had a great uncle who told me, you know, how can you expect to soar with the Eagles if you're surrounded by turkeys, right? Uh, that's why I love working with the veteran community. Um, you guys are fantastic. And uh, we look out for each other because we know we're not going to get anything done if we, you know, keep to ourselves. When I talked about, you know, General McChrystal and his keeping information to yourself, 
if you try to just be an individual, you're going to fail. You really will. Uh, so surround yourself with good people, be professional, uh, and, 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 you know, maintain that. So you got any more questions? If not, we can, what we can do is, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I'm going to, I'm going to probably end this here and I want to tell you guys, I appreciate you attending. Hit me up. Uh, I appreciate everybody coming and, and reach out to me if you have more questions. If you want to learn more about any of the things that I discussed today, please let me know. I love helping you out. Uh, I, you know, that whole thing about, you know, rising tide raises all ships kind of thing. Uh, if you get into cybersecurity, share, 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 not to the detriment of your organization or yourself, but share with your community. Or, I mean, whether I don't care if you're, you know, you work for Equifax and you're, you know, you, you got buddies that work at Experian or, you know, you work at Ford and you got some buddies that work at GM, you know, work with each other, share information. I still hang out. I still talk to my buddies at Equifax and Enterprise, you know. So, and if anything comes down a channel, I share it with them. Not anything that's, that's another thing. Learn about TLP, uh, traffic light protocols. When you talk about classified information, you got, you know, top secret, higher and top secret, uh, top secret, secret and classified and, and, and uh, confidential and all that stuff. I'm sorry, not classified, but confidential. Then, uh, no, uh, I was not there during that breach. Uh, but uh, that's the way traffic light protocols, whenever you're disseminating information, especially if you're getting information sharing groups, start tagging your stuff with TLP. Uh, yeah, good. You're you're implementing at your company, Richard. That's awesome. Um, there's a guide to it. Yeah, if you go into information sharing groups, you'll see it. Uh, but yeah, it basically says, who can I share this information with? Uh, so it it it. it it's that's a very important thing to do whenever you're doing your your information sharing so yeah clinton uh you know if you get out brother you know when you get out go ahead and and you know hit up some of these guys that you, you probably meet here if if you know tell them you know what your mos is or what your uh uh specialty was uh depending on service of course Hit up, hit up some of your uh, the people you met here, and if anybody's here, you know, talk to each other and be like, hey, I, if you're transitioning and you got a skill set that I, you know, I'm already working in the private sector, hit them up. You know, offer, send out your email to them. You know, and, and you you guys got mine. If you're getting out and you have a skill set that you think is going to be, uh, you know, value added to the cybersecurity community, or you want to ask questions about, you know, where can I, you know, what kind of resources can I use? Uh, what's some training that I should take, uh, you know, hit me up or hit up some of the other folks that are here if they offer it. Yeah. So I think we're about at that time. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you very much for putting up with it. I could have gone five, six hours if, if need be. Uh, <laughs> I like talking. I, I, I got a lot better. Uh, when I couldn't talk, uh, so uh, if I if I was delayed and 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 in everything and and uh, those those unintelligible pauses and stuff, I apologize. Uh, so it's it's uh, I'm doing my best. So I appreciate you all and and thank you. And like I said, reach out. And if anybody has any further questions, uh, just just write me at LinkedIn or send me an email. Cool, y'all. Thanks, everybody. Uh, love and appreciate you. We'll see you. Bye.